Okay, so in the last uh, week session, you know, we covered uh, marketing, PR, branding, etc. But we always knew that the big elephant in the room for an entrepreneur is sales. Sales is what's going to make or break a startup, right? Because get sales is the one that will actually end up, you know, getting you your first customer, getting you your stream of revenue going, help you get over your cost. Uh, get to cost uh, to cost break even business and then you know move on to building a profitable company and so on so sales is really where you know in my books uh, entrepreneurs are going to make it or break it and uh, and, and a new company is going to make it or break it i think uh, that is uh, you know kind of been my experience over the last 25 years companies may have the greatest products but if you don't get those orders um you're going to have a hard time building that into a significant company, right? You may have to exit very quickly and you won't get the returns that you would like to get from your startup. So uh, sales is where the action is. And um, so today we are going to do something interesting, which is um, we're going to go through the slides. Um, you know, I, uh, I suggested a book called um, Hope is Not a Strategy uh, about, you know, how to do complex selling. And, uh, and you'll see that, you know, I'm not going to cover, you know, all the other kinds of selling, the online selling and so on, because um, to me, like, you know, those are all kind of the subsets of, uh, you know, what sales is actually. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, not something that requires the level of sophistication uh, in the transaction that, you know, a sales a complex sale is going to get you. So, um, so uh, we are going to basically do something interesting, which is I'm going to have kind of taken the book and organized it properly so that, you know, we can in hour and a half or two, two and a half hours, we can go through the entire process and give you a fairly good understanding of what uh, selling a B2B or a B2B2C product is all about, like a complex sale, what is all, what's all about. And uh, along with me on the stage, we have got uh, Puneet Arora. Uh, Puneet Arora was a person that uh, joined my previous company called Selectica. And um, I hired him from the competition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Puneet has uh, built an amazing career in sales over the last uh, 15 years. So uh, without, let me just have Puneet kind of introduce himself so that you get a feel for the breadth of sales experience that you know he's going to bring to this particular uh, meeting. And then as we go through the slides, I'll give you some case studies that kind of you know, illustrate uh, the sales situations uh, that are talked about in the slide. But Puneet, who's got you know, hands-on 15 years of experience, he's right now the VP of sales for a $200 million company, um, uh, you know, he can supplement it with, you know, his own examples. And, you know, I know you guys are not shy about asking questions. So please keep that going. And, you know, because that's really how we are going to extract the most out of, you know, everything that Puneet knows and, you know, my experience with sales, etc. So, Puneet, why don't you kind of tell us about your background? Sure. Everybody hear me okay? <clears throat> Good. Yeah, Raj is right. Raja, Raja recruited me from the competition and introduced me into, into corporate you know, B2B selling. But you know, my sales journey started a little bit before that. I, I, I came to the US, uh, I was born in Southern Africa, a country called Zambia. I came to the US for, for my undergrad and uh, you know, dad basically gave me enough money to pay for my room and board and that was it. <laughs> Everything else was up to me. So I had to figure out how to get beer money, frankly speaking. <laughs> so what I ended up doing was, this is how I got into sales. I ended up, uh, I was in India once, and I, I, bought, I saw BDs and ended up buying, you know, 800 of those, actually 1,600 of those. So uh, two packs of 40 uh, BDs each and, and 20 bundles each. It cost me about, you know, 90 or so rupees, roughly $2. And I sold each one for a dollar. <laughs> so I made $1,600 on a $2 investment. 
And that's when I realized that, you know, sales was definitely for me. <laughs> so uh, after college, uh, I joined a, uh, a company, a company called Trilogy, based out of Austin, Texas. And yeah. College students wanted something different. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was a unique product and uh, not, too, not too expensive for a college student. So it was a very easy, easy sell, frankly speaking. Mm. So I moved to the, um, after college, I moved to a company called Trilogy and um, started off with one of their sister companies, a company called PCOrder.com. I was a sales guy number one, first salesperson for the company, and saw them through a, an IPO. Uh, and then from there, that's when I met Raj uh, at, at Comdex, actually. <laughs> uh, Raj was with Selectica. Uh, we were right in the booth next door. And after the show, Raj said, why don't you come move to the Bay Area and come, let's sell, let's sell Selectica. <laughs> so I took him on his offer. I moved to the Bay Area from Austin. I was employee number 22 at Selectica and uh, saw Selectica through a phenomenal IPO. Um, I left Selectica uh, after five years there and went to a company called Blue Roads, small company. I was a startup. I brought in the first, first customer all the way until we sold the company off. Um, and then from there, I decided I want to go try something a little bigger. Uh, I moved to Salesforce.com. I was VP of sales for their um, corporate sales division. Uh, which was their small medium business, uh, which is what basically built the Salesforce business up. Uh, from there, I was with them for about three and a half years, and then moved to uh, Oracle, where it's another small startup here in the Bay Area, um, where I ran uh, the Western third of Americas for their cloud computing business. Uh, I was with them for a few years as well, and then moved to now I'm at a company called Life Person, which, if you don't know about us, we do online chat. So if you go and you're chatting with any company, with any brand, we have about 10,000 customers, you're likely to use our technology. And we provide not only the, the chat technology, but also in some cases, the agents behind that. So we have full pay for performance and or you know, technology sell. So it's about a $200 million company. Great, okay. So, um... Oh, you remember G Greg Shabra? Oh, sure. <laughs> Calico, ex Calico. Ex Calico, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. So, but he was a little bit before you. He right? was before me. Yeah, I think he was employee number six or seven. Yeah. And uh, I think by the time he came in, you. I, I was gone. I mean, by the time I came, he was gone. He was already gone yeah. on yeah. his way out. <laughs> One. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, but I think there's an important message here, which is, you know, as a startup company, where do you get your information about customers, prices, strategy, product, features, you know, say, uh, presentations, what's a good presentation to make? You know, how do you sell into a complex organization? Uh, you know, it's really easy if you can hire a competitor. Uh, competitive salesman, because the salesman really represents the whole company. Think about it. You know, when a salesman goes out and, you know, talks to a customer, he needs to know the whole company. He needs to know how it ticks, how it works, you know. So, and uh, what I found uh, in general was that, you know, in general, you know, normally I don't hire the VP of sales when I go looking, because, you know, that's uh, not an easy acquisition by an entrepreneur. But on the other hand, what I've found is that behind every great VP of sales or a company that's flying high, there are regional directors who are firing on all cylinders, who know the stuff even better than the VP of sales, who's executing better than the VP of sales, and he's the one actually doing the stuff. He's the guy who's executing all the sales strategies and so on. So, and, you know, he can't rise up because there's a VP of sales on top of him. So I know that, you know, <clears throat> if I hire, if I offer a person who's one level below the VP of sales, if I find the right person who's capable, who's executing, and uh, who's very competent, but has basically not been able to move up to the VP of sales position, and I give him the opportunity to be VP of sales, 
I've got something to offer him, right? Mm -hmm. And I can bring him into the, into the into the fold, and then I can have him do for my company what he would have liked to do for the place that he was working in, right? So that was that's typically my strategy. Uh, <clears throat> so, in, in, and uh, for example, in my first company, Opti, that I talked about, <clears throat> what happened was that uh, there was a guy called Matt Reddy, and uh, uh, he was a sales guy for my competitor, and uh, he was selling to in Southern California. He was he was a sales guy there, or regional sales guy. And uh, you know, Opti had a very good product, but this guy was had all the relationships with the customer. So even with a weaker product, he ended up beating Opti in that particular transaction. And when I see some sales guy who can beat me with a weaker product, I know he's a good sales guy, right? He, because his relationships are really good. So on the other hand, that sales guy who beat me knows that you know, he is riding the wrong horse. Because even though he got the sale, he knows that, you know, he will do much better if he also has a good product to sell. So mm -hmm. as soon as, uh, even though we lost the sale uh, at this account to Matt Reddy, I called up Matt. I said, Matt, you know, I know you're beating us, so congratulations for you know, beating us at this particular account. But let me tell you that you know, uh, if you had the right product to sell, you would be 10 times more successful. You know, you are using all your skills at selling, trying to push a dog, you know. So why don't you come and start selling something that is a great product, but, you know, we don't have salespeople as good as you. And so he came in, and then he took over that whole region, and then he took over half of U.S., then he took over all of U.S., and then, you know, he became my worldwide VP of sales. So... Basically, like, you know, what happened was I, that's how I found, uh, you know, my sales guy. And then because he kept on growing uh, over the years, uh, I kept on promoting him. And, you know, these are the best kinds of VPs of sales that you can get because there's, uh, they know your business inside out. They know how to sell. They have a lot of credibility with the field. Uh, they know, you know, what it takes to hire the right person. So these these people become the greatest sales uh, VPs of sales. Uh, so two two lessons. One is, you know, hire somebody who's one or two levels below the VP of sales, and make him your VP of sales uh, because you know. And the second one is, um, you know, look at your competition in order to because you know, uh, there are lots of salespeople. Uh, every organization needs to have salespeople, and um, you, they are easy to find. What's important is, what's not easy to find is a salesperson who knows how to sell. Right? And and, right go ahead. Just to add to that, you know, when, 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 when I met Raj at, 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 at Comdex, you know, they, were, they, were, they had just won a deal with BMW Germany. Right. And we were selling at Comdex, which is a technology show. They were, had a, a configurator, which was in German, to an American audience. And they were, you know, it was a big win, but they were, it was very difficult for them to understand and how to portray that message to an American audience and, and, and to a technology-focused audience. So by bringing me on board, what they were able to do was define the go-to-market strategy for the healthcare, for the, sorry, for the uh, uh, technology market very, very quickly. I was able to say, hey, Raj, why are we focusing here? Let's go focus here. Let's not go focus on these kind of customers. Let's go try and focus on these kind of prospects. And the message was already kind of intrinsic to me. It was taking a superior product, frankly speaking, yeah. applying that to a, to a, to a, method, to, to a, to a market that I already knew and allowed us to go win. I mean, boom, 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 boom. over yeah. $100, $150 million worth of business is what we ended up bringing in the, in the high-tech market space. Exactly. Yeah. So it was approaching a market quicker and some mistakes that they would have made by not knowing the market, hopefully I was able to minimize those because of that experience. Go ahead. In terms of uh, recruiting sales folks from competitors. L louder. Oh, in terms of recruiting sales folks from competitors, uh, 
Uh, I know you had one case where you had to go resolve it personally yes. um, with the other company, but do you have any rules of thumbs or advice if you are going to post people from competitors how to do it with the least amount of friction? Yeah, so in general, salespeople, no problem hiring competitor salesperson because companies think that they have no IP. <laughs> That they, 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 don't get it. they don't have any proprietary information. So in general, hiring a salesperson is totally kosher. Don't worry about hiring salespeople. Uh, if you hire a VP of sales, you can get the management riled up because the VP of sales is typically involved in lots of executive level discussions and so on. But uh, in general, like, you know, uh, the apps engineer might know some proprietary stuff, but even he is regarded as it's okay to hire him. And these people, if you look at a lot of salespeople's resumes, they are typically at a company only three to four years. And because they're always kind of hopping up, hopping up, moving up, uh, stepping up to better and better opportunities. So hiring salespeople, don't worry about it. Hiring engineers, you've got to worry a little bit, and so on. Management, you've got to worry a little bit. But salespeople, no problem. Okay. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, I just put up this slide, and essentially it's a good slide to kind of position, you know, how your startup is going to sell. I mean, if you're a small company and you want to have no cost of selling, then try to build, build in virality. And we talked about virality last week, right? And you guys should have done your homework and read those slides. But virality costs nothing to sell. So the product sells itself. And your friend and the people users are actually promoting it for you, but on the other hand, you know, it's you're not really engaging in the sophistication of selling and what it means to sell and extracting maximum value. Typically, it's used for premium kind of companies and so on. On the other hand, and then there's a whole kind of um, range of companies uh, or selling techniques where you bundle in with uh, somebody who's got complementary products in order to so that. You don't ha have to worry about sales. It goes along with the other product. Or you go ahead and just put it up in the app marketplace. People will find it in that particular category that you are in, productivity category or whatever it is. Uh, or you team up with uh, uh, web design firms or service companies. That's what those two bubbles represent. Or you try online advertising. Uh, and then finally, like, you know, for most people, for most uh, startups, uh, who are building some technical product or something which has some complexity, uh, and your customers are going to be the mid-size or larger companies, uh, you know, you're going to be doing something called complex sales. And when you come to complex sales, now you need, you know, a sales, a selling approach, a selling strategy, and, and, and you know, so you're, you're going to have to put it all together from the sales side, right? And that's what we are going to focus in this class because once you get, once you understand how to sell uh, complex products, if it's a complex sales situation, you should be able to backtrack into other kinds of selling. Okay. Any comments on this? The only comment I'll make is, you know, if you look at all others except enterprise sales, they all are mostly pro product led. Um, Obviously, product is important no matter what you sell, whatever product the product does you know, is important. But everything else there is more product-led. Enterprise sales, I do believe, is, is salesperson-led. I mean, you represent the company, you represent the product. You can go and, frankly, change the perspective of the product with the client. Uh, in every, everywhere else, it's usually not that case. Right. Exactly. Why this is better? Or why, even though it is expensive, you still open your pockets. Yeah. So that, that requires your That requires selling, yeah. yeah. Okay, so. What about so, this engaging these sales agencies, uh, like appointment setters and all? Yeah, excellent. Uh, so basically, like, uh, when you do complex sales, essentially, there are three different ways of doing complex sales, okay? So one is direct sales, 
that's your own salespeople. The second one is something called sales rep. Okay, so these are salespeople who are professional salespeople that have decided to start their own sales company. And they basically sign up a set of complementary products to service the customers in their region. Okay, so they have the relationships, but they, are, they want to run, be an independent company from being tied up and working for some company or the other. So they are sales rep. So there are sales rep organizations with five, 10 salespeople who are all top-notch salespeople who got relationship with the top 15, 20 companies in the region. So, you know, these are the sales rep companies. Uh, this is true not only in the US, but actually is very true in a lot of foreign countries. So when you go to Korea, I always use a sales rep. When I go to uh, France, Germany, you know, I use sales reps, right? Because I don't know the language, I don't know the uh, culture, I don't know the systems, I can't set up the meetings. For me to hire a German person, I wouldn't know how to even choose one, right? So uh, the sales rep, you know, automatically gives me that op option. And the third variety is a distributor, where essentially, and typically it's a stocking distributor, but uh, you can have distributors even for software products these days. Uh, so they basically, you know, are more like demand fulfillment. They don't actually sell a product. So, you know, they will basically set up a show day or, or have a big booth in a conference and you'll give, get, a, get a small place to go ahead and do personal selling and so on. So three, three uh, categories of uh, ways to do direct sales, your own people or do sales, your own people, direct sales, reps, and distributors. And then obviously the kind of service you get will be proportional to, it's cheapest to do distributor, you get the least amount of service. Sales rep, you'll get a little bit more uh, mind share. And obviously direct sales, you get 100% mind share. But the cost is the highest, right? Good question. Uh, sorry, some examples of sales, people have taken companies, uh, they specialized for like, working so the question was, uh, I'm going to repeat the question for the people in the audience. So the question was, are sales rep specialized for different verticals? And the answer is absolutely yes. So there are sales reps who are good in medical equipment. There are sales reps who are good in semiconductor components. There are sales reps who are even more specialized with microprocessors or memory chips or whatever, uh, or, or you know, DSPs or whatever. So, uh, so basically, the sales rep you know, essentially tries to create a brand for himself uh, in this, from a sales standpoint for representing the best of breed that will allow him to provide a total solution for a particular set of problems. Okay? So, for example, uh, we used to have a sales rep, even though Chips and Technologies was here uh, in the Bay Area, uh, they decided that you know, they did not have relationships with all the PC manufacturers in the Bay Area. So they hired a company called Brooks Technical Group, BTG. I don't know if they're still around or not. I think they may still be around, yeah. But they hired BTG because they, BTG had about five or six people who had 20 years of experience connecting and selling products to all the PC manufacturers like Hewlett Packard and so on in the uh, uh, Hewlett Packard, Tandem, H, you know, all of these companies in the Bay Area. And uh, Chips felt that, you know, even to hire a direct salesperson who has got the relationships that the sales, sales reps that BTG had uh, was going to be hard. So they basically hired BTG, they, and you have to pay quite a bit in terms of sales commission to these sales reps and plus, they have the ability to kick you out if your product does not keep up with the competition. They'll switch you out in six months or a year and take a competitor's product if the competitor starts out-executing you on the product side, right? So, but they decided to go with BTG because it provided entry into the marketplace faster, right? Yeah. Batch selling from product or selling from services, where the differentiation starts coming in and what kind of strategy? So the question was? Selling products versus selling services. You want to talk sure. about that? 
Yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, you're selling. So you, you have to have the basic fundamentals regarding it, regardless if it's a product or a service, right? It's all about relationship. It's about value creation. Uh, the approach is what's different. You know, let's, let, let, let's look at software as a service. You know, technically you're selling a software, but you're actually selling a service. So to give you an example there, you know, it's, it, it's about, it really comes down to how do you, how do you explain that value? Uh, how do you, how do you provide, you know, what, what, how do you, how do you take and, and demonstrate the ROI, for example? Those are just certain nuances that are different. But at the end of the day, the true sales approach is almost, almost identical. There might be little different steps. For example, in selling a service, you might have to talk more about, you know, the consulting hours or look at a statement of work versus nowadays when you're talking about, uh, you know, selling a product or selling a software as a service, the consulting aspect is very, very minimal, if anything, at times. So there might be some nuances that are different there, but fundamentally, the approach is exactly the same. It's all about value, relationships, and ROI. So uh, this slide is well, one, one more question. Yeah. So um, you talk a lot about relationships that salespeople bring, right? So once you hire somebody who is in sales and you bring in a lot of customer relationships into your company, yes. how do you um, work into developing, like, you know, into proliferating those relationships within your company so that when that person leaves, he's not able to take those relationships to your competitors. So how, how do you... I think you asked an excellent question because you know the biggest worry that a com uh, com uh, that a uh, that a company has is that if the salesman quits and joins a competitor, you know your uh, the next order is going to go to with that salesman, and that's something that you worry about all the time uh, when you're on the management side, right? You're you're always worried that this. Because you know how relationship-driven uh, all these complex sales are. So essentially, you'll see one of the slides that we'll put up uh, at the end is called account management. So as soon as, you, as soon as you get the sale, the complex sale, essentially what has happened is that you have successfully executed a sales strategy that has enabled many layers in the, in, in the client organization to uh, decide that you're the best product and that you're the best company to do the deal, right? So the, typically the CIO uh, for, uh, or the VP of marketing or the VP of engineering at the C level, then there'll be a bunch of directors, there'll be a bunch of people in the purchasing department, there'll be a bunch of people in the engineering department, in the product service, customer service, a whole, typically it's a committee-based buying. So all of these people got exposed to your company, exposed to your product, exposed to the reason why you got bought, right? So as soon as you win, essentially what you have to do as a, co as a company is to create a shadow organization or a complementary organization in your own company. So for customer service, I'm going to have these people who are going to start connecting with the customer service person. For engineering, I'm going to connect him up with my apps engineer, but there's also going to be somebody in design who's going to be the godfather or who's going to be the support person if there's any technical issues. For the marketing side, obviously I'll connect to my marketing people. For sales, so basic and finance, I'll connect. So basically, I connect up the customer's organization and stakeholders with the co complementary people in mind. So guess what? Now I'm multiplying the relationships between my company and the other company. And you'll see when we come to the account management slide that there is a whole process that you have to execute. And the key process you, you have to execute once you win a deal is to continuously document why you are providing great value to the customer at the customer service, at the, uh, at the, at the at engineering level, at the finance level. So you've got to create and document, hey, th these are the benefits that our product gave you, that it brought your cost down, or it brought your efficiency up, or it brought your, and you're continuously documenting the benefits so that essentially you're mo trying to move the sale away or the relationship away from the sales guy who had the personal relationships 
and moving it to where it becomes a company to company relationship, right? So that, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the, you're right there. Something that I'll tell you, I'll give you a practical example of things we do. You know, we, um, we block off me as head of sales, I have my head of marketing, head of customer service. So I've seen two trends. The first one is we will actually block off 30 minutes a day. We'll pick, you know, five, six customers uh, and, and call them. Just, you know, most customers hear when there's something good or when there's something bad. Either when they want to, you want another order or something has gone wrong. So what we try and make a point of is every day just calling two or three customers. I'll call somebody on the sales side. The head of uh, marketing might call the, the, the CMO in the organization. Just build, continue to build that relationship. So if somebody leaves, you have multi, you're, you're multi-threaded in, the, in an organization. Second thing I'm also seeing today is that the customer support or the customer success, which is called now, is actually moved away from sales. So once a sale is done, the customer success org usually sits outside of sales in, in many organizations so that you know, they have two different touch points into their organization, outside of just sales. Go ahead. So I have a question. So if you have an average product but an excellent sales guy, versus if you have a great product but an average sales guy, how does that combination work and what is the, you know, an optimized way of managing it? Well, I, I'll tell you one thing, which is you don't want to be always selling an average product, you know, uh, because ultimately, you know, you're going to wear out your top sales guy's relationships. You know, so essentially you might get the entry with an average product, but you have to start working very diligently as a company. I'm assuming that you want to be a big successful company, right? So, so you have to diligently work at trying to figure out how to make your product great. And making your product great very often is as simple as knowing what to do. If somebody just told you that, you know, your product needs to have spec A, B, C. Today you only have these three uh, specs, D, E, F, but you know, you've got to get to spec number C, D, uh, B, and so it's like, you know, like Intel, right? Uh, we know that they are weak and low power. That's why they're not made into tablets and smartphones and all that. So as soon as they break into Apple with their desktop microprocessors, which they took, right? They took that, uh, the, all the Macs are built on Intel's uh, uh, CPUs now. Previously, it was all, you know, uh, ARM and so on, right? But then they broke in and got it. As soon as you break in, you know, essentially, you now have access and you have access and, and ability to extract the customer requirements. And it's easier to hire engineers than to find customers who will give you the right answers as to what needs to be done. Because you cannot hit for a low power target based on what the competition is doing right now. You've got to know what Apple wants two years from now in order to hit that target, right? It's got to intersect it. So basically, uh, you have to take your average product and make it better by extracting customer requirements and then executing an engineering strategy or manufacturing strategy or whatever it is to keep improving the product till it becomes the best. Okay. So uh, I'm talking about the weaker side of the Repeat the situation. question, I appreciate it. So two, uh, a manager and a technical person starts a company on their own. They build the product. They don't have yet VC funding. So they don't have luxury to hire a salesperson. Nor they have a top-notch product because they just build it and they are still coming off the ground. So they got every product yet in the market. And they are not salespeople. They don't have existing relationship. How do they break that? The question is, you know, if you have a, a newly formed company where um, the product is new because it's a newly formed organization and you don't have the capital to invest in, in high price salespeople, good ones are not cheap, that's for sure. So how do you, how do you break in into an organization? How do you leverage that kind of a situation? Well, the reality is, you know, you, you've got to have something special, first of all. It might not be perfect, but it's got to be something special, something different. You've got to find the right type of customer or prospect to go after. You can't just go after everybody. There you have to be really focused. Go find one, two, three people that you want to go after 
And there the passion should show, the, the product will you know, lead by itself a little bit. You'll have to form personal relationships. You will most probably learn a lot. Some of them won't be successful. You go to the next one. I mean, it's, it, it's tough. But I think that's where the product needs to shine and, and come out. Passion will need to come. And it's, it's, uh, it's an ongoing battle. There will be some wins, there'll be some losses. You'll fall down, you stand back up, go at it again. There is, there is no secret sauce or no secret formula for, for, for frankly, any of those kind of situations. <coughs> I agree. Right yep. to rate his passion, his product is cutting edge. Give us a chance, okay? Yeah. At least you know it's not the thing. Yeah, and, and you know, I think we talked a little bit uh, in a previous class about the need to find somebody called an early evangelist, mm -hmm. right? You've got to find uh, those people who are willing to take a chance on some cutting edge breakthrough technology or feature or whatever. So they're not everywhere. Most company, 95% of the, 98% of the companies or CIOs will, you meet will be very conservative. Uh, but there will be that 2%, 3% who are more, you know, who want that cutting edge stuff, who want uh, something new and great. Uh, and uh, they, they love it. They love new technology. And so you find them. And uh, typically, where do you think you find them? Conferences, exactly. That's the right answer. So conferences is where you find them. So typically the people who come to these conferences are looking for something new. So you already have, you know, a set of people that they go to these conferences at an early stage, uh, build up personal relationships with as many people as you can in those conferences. And, you know, you'll find, you know, a few early evangelists. Yes. From a personality perspective, what's the difference between a great salesperson versus an average salesperson? What are those critical things that a person should have that makes them a great salesperson? So the question is, what's the difference between a great salesperson and average salesperson? You know, um, an average salesperson, like a good salesperson, can break into an account. It's not easy, but they can break in. Being able to go in, what, what I think the differentiation comes is a great sales guy can explain the vision of what the product can do better than an average sales guy. When you're, when, you're, when you're going into an account, sometimes, most of the time, they don't even know they need your solution. You have to go and explain to them why, you need their, why they need your solution. 95% of the time, there is no budget. You've got to go create that budget. A, a, an average sales guy can't do that. They might be able to knock on the door, get a meeting, but a good sales guy can go and say, right, this is your business. This is where you're going. This is a problem that you do, you, you do not know you have. And now let me show you how you're going to go get the money to pay for this problem. That's the difference in my opinion. So we'll come to that in the very next slide. Go ahead. Uh, one quick question is, how do you know that you've hired a bad salesman? I mean, how, I know that you can wait for a long time and figure out <coughs> it's not the right one, but is there anything else you can do? So the question was, you know, how do you know you have not hired a bad salesperson, right? So <coughs> basically, uh, the hardest thing to hire is a salesperson in my books, because uh, you know, every salesperson should be able to sell most of us because they are salespeople. <laughs> they know how to do interpersonal selling. They know how to connect with you emotionally. So you forget that, you know, uh, as to why you're even hiring them, but they, you, they, suddenly they become your employee because they're that good, right? So every salesperson, if he's any good, should be able to sell himself to you. In fact, like every time I would interview, you know, regional directors or VPs of sales or even sales guys. I wanted to hire every one of them because every one was so good, right? Because of the way they present themselves, the way they tell their success stories, the way they, you know. So a couple of things that I started doing, which uh, on the face of it seems very brutal, which is I said, I would say, I want to see your W4. I want to see their uh, income tax uh, returns, the sales guys. So I want to see that you know, he actually hit the numbers that he's talking about. Because, so that, because the number is how you measure a sales guy. So I would actually ask them to fax me a copy of the last three, four years uh, W4, so I can see if there is a trend of him getting, making more and more and more money or whether it went up, 
came down, whether it was random, it was chance, or whether he had a consistent way of doing sales, right, and building up uh, his, his own personal. Because typically they get a fraction, 5%, 10%, whatever it is, of the revenue that they bring in, right? They are not uh, typically uh, commissioned based on the profit they bring in. Most of them are commissioned based on the total amount of revenue they bring in. So basically, if somebody brings in uh, $100,000, you know that you know, he brought in a million dollars worth of sales, assuming 10%, because it's between 6 to 15% is typically the range, what a, a direct salesperson will get. Uh, so I would ask for that. Uh, next thing I would ask for is references at the accounts that he claims he's got a relationship with. And uh, if his references go only up to the departmental head, uh, he falls in my metric. If it goes all the way to the VP of, VP of marketing or VP of engineering or even the CEO, now, you know, obviously, uh, my confidence goes up in him. And uh, so that's the second metric. So check his references and see what kind of references he gives you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You are a big guy. By the time you're asking sales guy for a W4 form and references, but for a startup, every sales guy is hyper. I mean, they, yeah, I mean, I know this now, personally. So, a scientist turned entrepreneur is it's not that great, but a sales guy is great. So, yeah, so the point is the question she asked was uh, if you're just a first time entrepreneur, right? Or a very young entrepreneur, not too much experience, uh, and you're dealing with a sales guy who's got 15 years of experience, right? And who probably made, you know, a quarter of a million dollars in commissions the year before. And, uh, you know, can you really ask him about his W4? And I would say, yes, you can ask a him. Absolutely. Go yeah, ahead. Absolutely. I mean, you, you've got to make sure you're making that hire and that hire is, is the right hire. So feel, feel free to ask for, that, ask for that proof. And I'll tell you, many people feel shy in asking for it, but you shouldn't. It's your company. If you, if you need to make sure you're hiring the right person. So it's yeah. absolutely a valid question to ask. In fact, a lot of, lot of people nowadays uh, will, will send copies. I, I receive, when I receive resumes, people will send me references already. They'll send me copies of their you know, W-2s. W-2s, not yeah, W-4. <laughs> already, I mean, they're, they're part, of the, part of the resume that come in. Well, so absolutely, don't feel shy asking. You were saying something third. You were about to say something. Uh, yeah, I kind of forget, but it's okay. <laughs> w2 and reference level, uh, and obviously, okay, uh, actually, the other thing that I look for is how effective is he at uh, communication, right? Uh, because really, uh, the salesperson has to build emotional relationship uh, with his clients. And uh, to build that, he needs to be a great communicator. And, um, you know, there are salespeople that, you know, they walk into your office and it feels energized. And, and you know, so I, I look for things like optimism. For example, uh, one of my best VPs of sales, if you remember, Chuck Pendle. Know him very, very well. Very well. <laughs> so Chuck Pendle was his VP of sales at Selectica. And uh, Chuck Pendle uh, joined Selectica when it was very, very small. And uh, what was interesting about him was that this guy was a very optimistic guy. And every day, he would spread optimism in the company. And the way he would spread optimism in the company is by saying, you know, these are the two good things that happened today. So he's, he's you know, he looks for the full, two good things that happened that day. Either a customer called back or he got a PO or, or he hired somebody or, you know, uh, our engineering people solved a problem or whatever. But he becomes kind of the messenger in the whole company. Hey, these are the two good things that happened today. So 
this is, it's great, you know, remember? Absolutely. So he basically brought optimism. See, uh, in a startup, you know, it's easy to get depressed and feel down because, you know, the competition suddenly launched a product, they're in the news everywhere, and they suddenly backed a big deal, or they went public, or they did this, and, and uh, you know, it's easy for your team to get depressed. And if they get depressed, they're not going to be very productive. So, you know, the VP of sales, when he goes ahead and becomes kind of a messenger of, you know, optimism, uh, it, 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 it really transformed our company. You agree? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it was infectious. It was infectious, exactly. I remember exactly. Walk, walking into the office and Chuck would be walking around saying, oh, guess who called? Look what happened here. And, you know, what I've noticed is, you know, you have your people who look at a glass half full and a glass half empty. What I've noticed is the great sales guys, always the glass is always half full, no matter what. You know, you could be, you could go into a, into a client and they say, thank you very much. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to use you yet. They come back and say, ah, he said yet. It means there's a chance there. <laughs> And go back versus the, the non-optimist would say, okay, I'm done here. Let me go somewhere else. So people who look at everything in an, opti you know, in an optimistic manner, I've seen always have that spirit and, and that, that ability to, to succeed. Yeah, so, okay. Um, as you're thinking about both sales and more channels, business development, yes. um, have you seen, it, seen cases where you can use sort of one person to do both or are there fundamental such differences in, in both that you so the question was like, you know, uh, typically there are three outward facing, three or four outward facing jobs in a company, right? You got your marketing, then you got your business development, you got your sales, and then you got your customer support and things like that, right? So these are all outward facing jobs. All the others are inward facing, engineering, others are inward facing. So uh, the question was, can one person be all these things, marketing, business development, sales? And I would say that in a startup, it's good to have one person who can do all three or all four initially be the one person because otherwise you've got to get these four people communicating with each other, right? So, and every time there's communication, there's friction, there's misunderstanding, there is incomplete information. So I think if you can find uh, somebody to complement the founding team with one person who can do marketing, business development, sales, and customer support uh, all in one, which is what I did at Opti, which is what I initially did at Selectica, then um, I think you're already ahead of the curve. So what would you call the team or prototype? No, it's VP of marketing and sales. Yeah, it's, it's easy. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Raj, uh, given the limited resources a startup would have, yeah. how, would you, how would you allocate the sales budget into various channels? The question was like, how do you allocate uh, the budget? Any ideas? It, it really depends on, you know, what stage you are in. But usually, you know, if, you, if you're earlier on, and obviously those kind of dollars are not there, but in a, in a you know, Later stage startup, you usually you're about 35, 40 percent of your of your uh, revenues, you know, go back into sales. So that might be high for an early stage company, but that's usually the case in later stage organizations. Yeah, later stage companies, it comes down in the 10, 15 percent range, but for companies that are powering through to get to a certain size, typically, you know, at Selectica, we're investing 60 percent of our. Uh, of our, uh, you know, uh, revenues into sales, 60%. So, because we wanted to grow faster than, you know, 5, 10, 20% 20, 20 year over year. We wanted to grow at, you know, 100%, 200% year over year. So when you want to grow at that rate, you have to invest. And without, if you don't get the orders in, how are you going to grow? Right, so out of the 60%, what was the allocation, say, for social media That's uh, it again depends on the product, right? It depends on the product where, as to what you need to do. So if you have something that's going to require a big funnel versus rifle shooting, if, you do rif if it's a rifle shooting business, big game hunting business, uh, you know, we were doing, at Selectica, we were doing configurators, which was big game hunting, where, you know, there were only like 
20, 30 opportunities per quarter available for the whole industry that were in the million dollar plus range, which is where we were focused. You know, uh, obviously we put all our money into sales guys, sales guys and the app team supporting them and the telesales group supporting them and so on. But uh, at Opti, where we had, you know, 100 motherboard manufacturers and so on to go after, you know, we would go ahead and uh, put more on marketing and creating a reputation in the industry, a brand in the industry, and have fewer sales guys because, you know, typically, you know, once we got the order, it was just a question of order fulfillment that had to be taken care of, picking up the POs and servicing them, so on. So it depends on a little bit on the product also and the market that you are in. Absolutely. Uh, we've, I've done that in the past before. You have to find the right person. You know, uh, that person has most probably had some success because so that, you know, they, maybe a, a base salary is not as important to them or they're very young and very hungry and, you know, they, they live off the, equi uh, off the, off the, uh, the commission, the variable part. But absolutely, you have to find the right person. I've, I've actually at one of my startups have built a team of about six guys that was purely commission-based. Because we did not, this is Blue Rose, we were a, we're a startup, we, had, we didn't have the, the dollars up front to, to pay, a, pay a base. So we paid it purely based on commissions, the higher commission tier, and there was very strong equity. Uh, but absolutely. Go ahead, Tiger. I just have a comment to make on that. Um, uh, I'm not being in sales, I have sold hundreds of millions of dollars, but never carried a bag. Getting the PO is magical, you, hats up to you. <laughs> Um, yeah, we did all the rest, but never could get the PO, but for you guys. Now, what I want to say is, talk to salespeople because they are one of the most no BS type people. If you're not helping, they'll drop you the drop of a hat, right? Second, if they're interviewing in your company, that means they see money, a part of gold. So that is, in some sense, a validation that there's somebody saying that I can make money out of it. It's actually a good thing to do, to talk to salespeople, because I've never seen any salesperson join any company or work on any product line where they cannot make a living. If you can't sure. sell. Sure. And, and the yeah. third comment I want to make is um, uh, the sales for enterprise, right? Uh, it depends on the product line to some extent. The, the mindset with cloud is very different than infrastructure. Absolutely. Very different than other types of products. So depending on your startup, you may have to choose the right type of salespeople with a Rolodex in your first beachhead. And uh, that is where uh, right now I'm having uh, challenges because uh, it's not easy uh, for salespeople to leave. If they're really good, they're making a lot of money. Why would they join a startup where the promise is not there? Okay, uh, let's let's roll on a little bit, and then I'm sure we 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 all can we'll continue with the questions. Okay, so uh, I think we've covered most of this. Uh, okay, so coming to selling styles. So, you know, this is uh, interesting because you know there are seven types of salespeople that you're going to see out there, and it all depends on the maturity of the sales guy. So, if you look at it, the one at the bottom. Uh, left corner is somebody called a teller because they can basically only talk about their product. They cannot understand, they don't know what the customer needs are, they don't know what benefits your product has to the customer, but they can keep on talking about the features of your product. Oh, I've got an uh, 8 bit microprocessor, I've got something that is CMOS, that is, I've got something that's low power, I've got, you know, all they can talk about is their product. They cannot talk about, you know, in what situations you need it, what would be the benefits, short-term, long-term, ROI benefits, et cetera. So they are tellers, right? And typically, you need tellers, you need all these kinds of salespeople in an organization. So it's not that you just need the best guy, uh, which is at the top right-hand corner, versus, uh, and not, don't need people at the, at the other end. So you need all the way from tellers all the way to, you know, uh, industry network consultants. We'll come to that. Uh, so basically, these guys are the ones who are happy to day in, day out, talk about your product. So when you go to a trade show, you know, uh, 
you need several tellers to stand right next to the booth, next to, next to the equipment that you're selling. So they are tellers. They keep on talking about the same product over, over and again without getting tired, with enthusiasm, et cetera. But, you know, that's all they do, right? Uh, then we move on to the next one, which is uh, sellers. So sellers are people who know how to sell benefits, which means they can understand a customer's problems and can figure out on what parameters the customer is going to make a buying decision so that you uh, talk about benefits in that area. For some people, you know, profitability is important. For some people, efficiency is important. For some people, ergonomics is important. For some people, uh, safety is important. So uh, some people, security is important. So depending on what the requirements are or expectations are of the customer or the, or the prospect, the salesman spins the product and focuses on that area. No point talking about efficiency to somebody who's most worried about security. You know, you say that, oh, we can have only two cameras and it'll service the, provide you, you know, full coverage. But this guy says that, you know, it'll provide you 90% coverage. But the guy who's concerned about security will say, I want 100% coverage of the area. I don't want 90%, you know. So, uh, so a seller is somebody who can uh, do needs and assessment and then figure out the, how to promote the benefits. On the right-hand side, you'll see that there are something called hunters. So a hunter is somebody who actually can sell benefits, but he does one more thing, which is what uh, Puneet talked about. He can create the demand, and he can wage a competitive uh, fight. Because competition in selling is actually a you know, very sof sophisticated way that you compete in order to win, right? And uh, we'll, we'll, do a, we'll cover some of that stuff. So hunters do that. Uh, then moving up to the, to the left uh, is some, somebody called farmers. So farmer is somebody that is, he's in your current account, but he's keeping the eyes open to see what other opportunities are there inside the company. So he is picking up deals all the time which have not even been released to the marketplace for which there's no competition. But, you know, he can say that, oh, you know, this is where in a service organization you absolutely need farmers, right? Your project manager better be a good farmer because if he's not a good farmer, as soon as the project is done, you're out of the door, which means that you are not in the inside meetings, you're not uh, hanging around the coffee, the coffee machine, listening to you know, what else, uh, what other projects are coming up, what other requirements are coming up, uh, things like that. So, or you know, what the new budget is going to include money for this particular project that, is, uh, that we're going to be starting or we're going to be starting to write a spec on something like that, on something or the other. So the farmer is the guy who's inside the company and has continuously got his radar, you know, check, finding out all the different opportunities all the time, right? So, and these are all extremely efficient ways of selling because, you know, you basically don't have competition. When you sell without competition, uh, it's going to be nice, profitable business, typically and it's going to be comfortable business. When you sell with competition, typically your price comes down, time to delivery comes down, feature set requirements go up, support requirements go up, maintenance cost uh, uh, payments come down. So all bad things happen, and before you know it, it becomes like you know break even or even losing kind of business, right? But you just do it to win the order, right? So the farmer is the guy who's going to take that first order, which may not be profitable, and convert it into a gold mine or a gusher because you're make, picking up orders right, left, and center from everywhere. And then uh, partners is the other one, which is folks where two plus two equals five. So it's their product plus your product provides such a complete solution that, you know, the customer gets lots of benefits. So if he can sell his product, then automatically 
the customer would buy your product because he's going to get two and a half times the benefit, right? So that's partners. So, and right in the middle are what we call business developers. So the business developer is somebody who can create demand and is like a rainmaker. So he has basically got the ability to talk to executive level people and say, look, you know, if you guys had this capability, you would have a strategic advantage in the marketplace. Your client's company will have a strategic advantage in the marketplace by using uh, some new capability that, you're, that, you, that, uh, that uh, could magically show up. And then it turns out that your company provides that solution that can magically uh, provide the competitive advantage. So business developers do that. And finally, at the top is something called the industry network consultant, because this guy is setting the direction of how the industry is going to evolve. So if you remember, you know, a lot of people become industry gurus. And we read about them on VentureBeat, we read about them on, on all these things. So these guys have the ability to tell everybody that the world is going to move to the cloud. Or the next thing is going to be, you know, different kind of computing solution for how servers are going to be designed. We're going to have blade servers. You know, blade servers were not there till some industry network consultant or somebody, some guru said that, you know, we need to have blade servers so that there should be one rack in which you can just keep sticking servers one by one. And the benefit of being having swappable servers is worth having investing in a million dollar rack even before you put in one server inside. So somebody created the vision for blade servers. And that's typically the job of the INC, because once this guy creates that vision and the industry, like the Titanic, starts rolling down that direction, uh, you can own the whole market. And uh, you can see that, you know, Intel tries that all the time, Google tries that all the time, Microsoft tries it all the time. They're all trying to get their INC to communicate the vision at a conference or in blogs so that the world starts moving according to their vision. If the world starts moving according to their vision, all CIOs start saying, we've got to have cloud in the house. We've got to have private cloud. You know, having AWS is not good enough. We've got to have a private cloud for security and all that. And that is the only way we are going to uh, have a secure solution, whether it's true or not. Uh, then basically, uh, you know, whoever provides uh, private cloud solutions is going to take over the market and become a very successful company. Want to add to that? Yeah, let's let, let him add a little bit. More. So just just to add to that, you know, the key thing to note is everybody is different. You need all of those people, and all of those are valuable. In a in a in a fast paced say cloud company today, those tellers are very very valuable because they can get you those smaller deals, but get them to you quickly, which is very, very, you know, needed in, in a smaller size organization. So all of those people are needed, but the key is to understand that everybody is different. Me personally, I started off as a teller. I would go in and start giving away all these feature functions and somebody said, hey, enough, listen to me, listen to what I have to say first. And that's how you grow and became a hunter and kind of moved onto that the top right-hand corner. I, for example, can never be a farmer. I just, I don't have that perspective. I don't have that ability to go in once a client is there and just kind of work them over time. It's not me. I am on this side. So everybody is different. Every salesperson is different. You have to see what it is you want and then find the person who fits that role. So that, that was just a, an observation I had. No, and, and so, so actually somebody, remember we asked that, answered the question as to how you hire salespeople. You got to know Excuse at me. the stage of company you are in and, you know, the kind of spot you're trying to fill. You want a hunter, you need a teller, you need a farmer. You put a hunter in the job of a farmer, disaster. it's going to be a disaster. You put a farmer in the job of a hunter, again a disaster. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be eaten alive. So, so the thing is that, uh, you know, 
when you choose your salesperson, so for example, you know, um, when uh, at Selectica, like, you know, uh, for the Eastern region, there were only about three or four companies that could support a five, $10 million license deal for Selectica in the configuration area. One of them was IBM. So if I want to get IBM, where the sale is probably going to take a year or two, or two years, and the deal when it comes in is going to be worth tens of millions of dollars. Um, you think I can put in a teller? No. Can I put in a farmer? No. Can I put in a, a seller just selling benefits? No. I had to put in a big game hunter. So, you know, I had, we had to search, search, search till we found uh, the guy in Atlanta. Rob Milks. Rob Milks, yeah, right. I found dinner with him last week. Huh? You know? Okay. Yeah. So we found this guy called Rob Milks. And, um, you know, he's a, got a southern drawl, slow talking guy, but, you know, like a, like a hunter, you know, he can basically uh, go ahead and track, you know, how things are moving in the organization at IBM and how to go in and slowly, you know, build relationship with this, 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 this. And in two years, our competitor Trilogy, uh, which was his previous company, they had a hundred, IBM had invested $172 million in Trilogy's core technology and building a team and using the product over about uh, eight years by, the, by then. Something like that, by yeah. seven or eight years they'd spent. $172 million they had spent on Trilogy. And our goal was to kick out Trilogy from that account and make it into a Selectica customer for configuring the mainframes and everything else. And, um, you know, two, two and a half years later, uh, we basically kicked out Trilogy from their account and closed, I think, a 13 or $14 million license deal and services deal, another $15, $20 million, and which kept on growing. So... So the point is that, you know, we required a big game hunter where we were willing to have him develop this account over two, three years in order to, you know, achieve what we felt was a very strategic goal. Wouldn't you put a BD person for the troll rather than a hunter? A big difference between a BD person, a business developer, and so on. Often not measured on commission. Yeah, the... Yeah. No, what the BD person does is uh, two things. One is he does partnership, which is not what we want here. Here, I want account to be brought into, uh, into uh, the Selectica portfolio. I wanted business, actual direct business from that customer. So I do not want a partnership. If I want partnerships, I'll get a business developer. Uh, so since I wanted that, I needed somebody who can convert the demand that he's created, the vision that he's sold, the ROI that he's communicated, the, uh, the product evaluations that he's supported, all of that has to be brought together into something that results in a PO at the end. PO requires, every, typically a 10, $14 million PO will require about three or four levels of signature, which means that, you know, the insuring manager will have to approve it, and from there, it'll go into the purchasing department. Purchasing department will go to the VP of finance. It'll go to maybe even the CEO. Because there's a $15 million order that's going straight to uh, another vendor. So typically, any of them can say, oh, we don't have the budget. You know, why can't we push it out? Because typically, like, you know, there's a lot of demand for, you know, money that has to be spent, right? So uh, essentially, you need a big game hunter who can address and communicate the value to all the different stakeholders in getting this massive deal through the company. Yes. So in this kind of situation, where it took two years to close the deal, knowing mm -hmm. IBM, you expected one plus year, how do you keep sales guy motivated and in the game because for the first year he doesn't even get any commission. Yeah. That's a very good point. So these 
Yeah, so big game hunters are not motivated by, by short-term small commissions. So typically he would also have some small accounts because, you know, you don't have meetings with IBM every day. So he also had like another three or four small accounts that'll see that he makes pretty good money. But, you know, the day he brought in the IBM deal, that year he took in a million and a half dollar commission check. One check, million and a half. Which... And, and he had those checks for three, four more years after that. And he probably had yeah. checks on, uh, of that you side. You have to find the right mentality. That person yeah. wanted, A, A, that person was motivated by that kind of money. B, that person had the thrill for those kind of accounts. Yeah. You know, going and closing small deals. Some people enjoy them. There's nothing wrong in that. But to go in and say, you know, I'm willing to wait for two years and close an account that size, that complex, that deals with so many different executive decisions, you've got to work with so many different personalities. There's and, a certain and, kind and of a And typically big, hunt, big game hunters uh, uh, love risk. So Rob Miltz, you know, he used to do uh, motorbike jumping. So he would uh, take off and jump 60 feet in the air with his motorbike. And, you know, it requires risk takers, guys. So that's what a big game hunter is all about. I mean, till he fell down once and then, you know, but is he still into risk taking? No, his wife made sure he doesn't. He had a big accident yeah, yeah, right yeah. before the IBM deal, actually. Yeah. So his wife has made sure he doesn't, uh, get, on a motorbike doesn't get on a motorbike ever again. But he broke like 60 bones. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> it's like he's doing great, though. But he's doing great. Yeah. He's a great guy. Yeah, go ahead. So in this selling styles, uh, two things uh, are confusing me. Where does the marketeer fit in? And where does uh, the influencer uh, fit into this? Go ahead. So I'm not sure I understand what an influencer would do. But for me, uh, a marketer was, I mean, this is selling. Marketer will help you create demand. Maybe help you get into the account. But I frankly, I think that's where, you know, Marketer might continue that, but they do not go create the value. They do not go create the, the ROI, go create the need, go create the, you know, frankly, the, the deal. That's not what a marketer does, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Small startup, yeah. five, six people. Yeah. I can't afford to have all these problems, okay. right? So yeah. one person is doing all that. So he's sure. doing marketing, he's doing sales. And uh, of course, I have my eye on IBM too, so I need to invest some time in that activity. But uh, so that, that's the marketing aspect of it, demand gen part of it. When we talk about the influencer, it's uh, somewhere in between the partner and the uh, industry network consultant who's uh, helping shape uh, influ uh, the, 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 the direction of the industry as well as he's not getting commission or any compensation. Is that, is, I mean, I've seen that in, in, in many situations. That's maybe an external person. It's not within your organization. It might be, you know, somebody, um, I know a company that, is doing uh, some stuff in the healthcare, uh, gamification of healthcare applications. And they have a few influencers who are very well respected in healthcare and, you know, in, and understand, you know, how healthcare can be changed and modified through games. So they have helped this friend of mine who's the CEO of this company go into large accounts and say, this is something, this is why you need to do this. But I think those are not generally people within the organization because a five, six person company, you might not be able to afford somebody to bring in who's just an influencer. But if you can find that, I think that's great. I think it's an ecosystem that has... Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Okay, go ahead. So as a startup, so you are limited by resources and you are also network is small. How do you find this kind of high bandwidth people? Which one? The, which one? you can use to, get, uh, to find them. Like Rob Mills, how do you find them? Okay, so for example, like, you know, I needed to have actually, you know, a big game hunter when we started Selectica, right? Because, you know, I could not, you know, all the configuration deals were half a million dollars and up. So, you know, an ordinary sales guy could not do it. So in my particular case, like, you know, I take somebody who's, a low level or mid level person and give an opportunity to be VP of sales with uh, and you know when you when you give VP of sales and bring him into the C level he's automatically getting 3% 5% of the 
equity in the company. So there will be some people who are salespeople who are willing to, you know, uh, take equity uh, and also have a shot at being a VP of sales who can bring in the initial deals and then grow the organization. So they like the opportunity, you know? So uh, that's, and, and that's, uh, you'll always find such people. And uh, typically they are at your competitor or they are uh, typically at your competitor, you'll be able to find them. Yeah. And, uh, I think you just, I mean, you have to, I'll tell you, as, as, as VP of sales at, at Salesforce, I spent, 20, even though Salesforce had the resources to go find whoever they wanted, we spent 25, 30% of our time recruiting. You know, you at least, you know, two or three people a day, frankly speaking, we were talking to. So finding the people, I mean, LinkedIn is nothing better than LinkedIn. You got you to gotta go find them. And then you got to go to find the right person who will be, enticed depending on what stage you are by you know, whatever metric it is, that it be equity or high cash or the thrill of a big deal. It's, it's, that's the toughest job is finding the right person. Okay, uh, let's move on to understanding a little bit about what demand creation is because uh, ultimately the job of a top-notch sales guy is to create a vision in the customer's mind that enables him to really feel pain or a need to solve that pain as quickly as possible or feel that, you know, if he can just do this, he would have a great competitive advantage in the market or strategic advantage in the market, or he can reduce, you know, money that he's losing or wasting away or he's draining away uh, if he's financially driven. So it's basically demand creation is a very important element that the salesperson does. And you know, that has to be done uh, basically by communicating, by talking. For example, uh, to me, the, the most fun thing that I've done in terms of demand creation was you know, uh, during my IPO cycle. It just so happened that I was flying back from Paris to San Francisco, and on IPO cycle, they put you in first class. So I was trying my first class from Paris to San Francisco, which is a eight hour flight. And then uh, I'm sitting on this, in this, in this nice cushy chair and sitting right next to me, I see this guy who's got a stack of, you know, financial documents that he's reading, et cetera. I said, uh, what's he reading? And then I find out that the company called Louis Vuitton. So, and it turns out that, you know, uh, he's the president of Louis Vuitton who's stuck sitting next to me for eight hours. And, uh, and, you know, so this guy, you know, goes through all his financial documents and all that, and then he has his dinner, and then promptly goes to sleep. And, you know, here I'm sitting next to a phenomenal opportunity to sell, and he's going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, uh, what I did was, um, I also, you know, took a nap but kept one eye open, <laughs> waiting to see when he would wake up. And then after about, you know, three hours, the guy just uh, wakes up and, you know, gets uh, tea or coffee or something from their hostess and all that. So I also stretch out and wake up at the same time, <laughs> order some stuff. And then, you know, I said, uh, you know, I pull out my prospectus and all that to show that, you know, I'm also reading some important stuff. <laughs> So, uh, and then like, you know, I, then I just casually turned to him and said, you know, what do you do? And so he said, oh, I'm CEO of uh, uh, Louis Vuitton. So, you know, obviously they sell all the luxury goods, et cetera, and so on. So I just lobbed a question like, you know, you know, I said the whole market is right now, you know, looking very actively at the internet. A lot of people are going, are looking at the internet to do all the buying, uh, have you all thought about it. I said, yeah, you know, uh, we've been looking at it. And then I said that, you know, at that time, about 10 years back, 14 years back, actually, Cisco and Dell were regarded as kind of the leaders in internet marketing. Dell for selling, you know, PCs that are configured right on the internet. 
you know, you can just configure the memory, the disk drive, the uh, CPU, etc., the box size, and so on, and boom, they send you a PC that is exactly yours. And then Dell, uh, Cisco was the other one that, obviously, Cisco would do it because they wanted to promote the internet for business use, right? So uh, 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 the CEO was always talking about how business is going to move to the internet and things like that. So, so these two guys were regarded as the two evangelists for online uh, uh, business usage for the internet. So, um, so, and it just so happened that, you know, Cisco had just signed a multi-million dollar order with, uh, with Selectica, and Dell had signed a $10 million deal with Selectica. So... No, that I, was my deal, right? Dell was your deal? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there was also, who's the sales Dave, guy? David H.M. and me? Yeah, yeah. okay, David H.M. and you, exactly. Okay. Yeah, you're from Austin. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So, um, uh, so basically, um, you know, both of them were our customers. And uh, so I just said that, you know, Dell is doing this. And, you know, we have seen their, ex their you know, interest in the products uh, explode. And I had some numbers, et cetera. And Cisco, and that, a lot of this was in the press also that, because all of them were trying to promote how well their online channels were doing because Wall Street loved that story, right? And... Uh, and so I said that, you know, with LVMH, you know, there's an opportunity for online selling to become the main, uh, you know, channel through which they can sell their products, et cetera. And uh, the more I talked to him, the more excited he got. And I said that, you know, we are the key engine that's driving all this online buying because, you know, we do this configuration. The customer doesn't have to worry about it. They can only focus on their needs. And uh, so... You know, he said that, you know, my uh, CIO will give you a call, uh, uh, you know, uh, next day. And next day, you know, a CIO calls up and says, I don't know why, but, you know, the president wants me to send you a purchase order for $4 million. What is it for? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, three days later, we went public and I had this $4 million PO from this, uh, you know, uh, uh, from this uh, situation under my belt. But essentially, I ended up creating a need. Uh, but because I created the need at the CEO level, you know, it was the highest leverage position. Now, it's very rare that a vendor can get a chance to spend eight hours <laughs> next to the captive CEO of a company, right? Typically, you'll get five minutes, 10 minutes. It's not easy to create this level of demand in five, 10 minutes. But, uh, you know, to create the trust, to be able to give him supportive information about Dell and Cisco, and then tell him more about Selectica and all that stuff, uh, and how it could be implemented, and what's the vision about how it would all work. So, essentially, like, you know, uh, if you can get a chance to do high-level selling, what are your high-level selling stories? So, you know, uh, let, let me just start by saying the demand creation role, frankly, in my opinion, is one of the most toughest and most complex things to do. Uh, usually, you know, people enjoy the thrill of closing a deal, but getting the deal can even, or getting the deal started can be just as exciting and frankly, very, very complex. Um, I'll tell you a story, you know, Raj, is, Raj not only created demand, he closed that deal with uh, you know, LVMH as well, which is very rare, but... Uh, I'll tell you about a story just very recently, about two months ago. I don't know if you guys heard of, this is what's happened within my organization. Uh, Comcast and Time Warner Cable are looking at a merger. And I don't know if you saw this uh, video that somebody posted about his experience with Comcast and the mm -hmm. customer service that he got and went viral. There are 10, I think 10,000 articles created on that. Everybody's nodding, they have seen it. <laughs> yeah. and, and as a result... They are now, the SEC is now looking to see, they've put a hold on the merger to see if this will create, you know, a, a consumer problem. So one of my guys, one of our demand generation guys, guy is 25, 26 years old, said, you know, this is an amazing opportunity. So he went and found, you know, 100 people in the company that use Comcast. Life person is, is based out of New York City. So a lot of Comcast there as well. He found 100 people in the company that use Comcast. Said, all right, guys. I want you guys to go in and start chatting because that's what we provide with Comcast. They use a, a different technology. Started chatting and then you know, take screenshots of the, of the chats. 
He took 100 chats, went and looked through those chats, tried to understand what the, what, what the chats were all about. Uh, we have software that can analyze text and, and come up with some you know, keywords and things like that. And then created a small video that he sent to the CEO. Mm. These days, getting to a CEO is not that difficult. It's very easy to find who the person is and connect to them on LinkedIn or find them on, 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 a, on any other social media site, understand what they do. And sent them a video saying, did you know this about your organization? These are the four key problems you're having. CEO called back. Uh, well, he didn't, but he asked his head of uh, customer service to call back. And you know, we should close hopefully a four or five million dollar deal uh, this quarter within about a 90 day sales cycle. Amazing. But this is you know different way of thinking of demand generation. Another guy I know, uh, you know, use social media uh, to understand what a CEO. No, actually, you know, he's going after the head of e-commerce. You know, used to go and buy. Always tweeted about this store where he went and had lunch. This restaurant. So he would always go there every Thursdays. So next time he went, the this guy said, "Yo, this guy's going to come. I want to pay for his lunch." So the guy <laughs> went and had lunch, and said, the, the waitress came and said, "Your bill's been paid." The guy's like, "Who, who paid my bill?" And the small note came and said. I, I spent 15 minutes understanding who you are. Please spend five minutes with me. And the guy was like, I'm more than happy to spend five minutes, you know, with this young 25-year-old uh, demand generation guy. Mm. So different ways of trying to get to people, you know, if you personalize it, make it about that person, people will talk to you. So one of the toughest things to do, but if you do it well, it's the basis of what makes a good sales. Being too aggressive versus yes. being too pushy. Because a lot of sales guys can be pushy, and the moment you talk to a sales, you're like, you know, there is always that thing goes up, right? The barrier goes up the moment a sales guy talks. Sure. I, I would say that's are you creating value in what that person does? You know, we all want to hear about things that make us better or something that helps us. So, where I have seen pushy people, and I, we, we all get sales calls all day long. Right, it's where it's just like, hi, this is me. This is who I am. Okay, I want to talk to you about this. Is this? When do you have five minutes? Well, it's a, nothing that's important to me. Somebody who's taken the time to understand a little bit about you or about your organization, about your pain your organization is going through, and has put some thought into it. When they reach out to you, it will shine. It you will see it. You will see the person understands who you are, understands the value that they provide to you. And those people will, will, will so jump me, out to you. Let me add something, which is that, you know, there's two phases, you know, during the sales interaction. One is where he's trying to create trust, mm -hmm. uh, where he wants to understand you, you know, he's nice to you, he wants to understand you, understand your needs, etc. because he's trying to become a trusted advisor, because he knows everything about his product, his abilities to provide service, etc. And he tries to understand your needs, etc. And if he's a good salesman, you know, the way he'll communicate with you will convince you to share your pain and all that with him so that, you know, he can solve, because he'll, he'll solve your problem, right? So he becomes a trusted advisor. Now, w the other element is to take that transaction into a purchase order, which is what Nagesh struggle, was, is struggling with, and most marketing people struggle with, most engineers struggle with it, which is asking for the order. And that is what uh, uh, weak salespeople or salespeople who are not polished or who are not uh, totally experienced, that is the commonest mistake because they basically forget that ultimately their job is to get the purchase order. And if they don't get the PO, you know, no point being a trusted advisor. So you need salespeople who can do both elements really well where they become the trusted advisor, and then once they become the trusted advisor, they should be able to put you in a position where you have to go ahead and m make the decision, buy or not buy, right? Because I have seen so many situations, um, you know, when my wife's buying saris or whatever, you know, she'll a great sales guy will you know, become a trusted advisor to my wife and show her all the stuff and she loves it and ta-da-da-da-da. And then just when I feel that, you know, okay, he's got, 
my wife probably hooked on, on he'll say let me show you three more sorry <laughs> that's the end of that deal because then after another one hour my wife has to run to the next appointment so that transaction because closing the order also takes a little bit of time because you got to put that uh, prospect under a little bit of stress to pull out the checkbook and see whether you know will my husband really not get very upset you know if i buy one more saree i got 100 up there already one more you know but you know so there's stress who does who minds see, not seeing right virtual enjoyment of seeing sarees is great but you know uh, ultimately the sales guy his job is not to just provide virtual enjoyment of sarees you know his job is actually to sell something right and so if he does not ask for the order and that's what we're going to learn in negotiation the week after i'm going to push out uh, class so it'll be december 10 is how do you convert your trusted advisor situation and actually come to the point where you ask for the order and um, i've seen lots of kind of big company sales guys when you hire they have lost the art of asking for the order they you know because the big company automatically provides the cushion for the order to come in so they just become trusted advisors you hire a big company sales guy from cisco and so on in my books they are you know punching bags you know because they will make you feel good that the customer loves it look you know i've got this relationship i bind him we played golf together da 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 no pio like you know quarter goes by no pio month you know month end no pio and uh, you know uh, to me sales people that cannot convert the trusted advisor thing into a purchase order are going to become a big problem for your company tell me more yeah no you you spot on i mean it's it's it, it, it's an art to go close and 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 create that demand and create that need you know just just to add to that how do you do that right and let's let's take that sari example you know when kalpana is shopping for sarees you know the the guy will say let me put this one on the side let me put this one on the side all he's doing is 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 closing the pool ask a question so when do you need the sari by oh you need it next week okay great we have to do some work on it that's going to take 4 days so you need to make a decision now so he'll put three four sarees on the side and say okay you know this is nice this is the last piece left try and create that urgency yeah. and then kind of drive you through that and say okay yeah, three, these are the four which one do you want so you're right most good sales people know how to get to that decision and in a in a business world in a, in a, in a in a in a technology cell you know it's all about roi it's all about it's actually about two two different ways one is creating value which is showing them an roi showing them why this why this decision hurts their or not doing this decision hurts their business second way is making it personal we have actually told people if you do this 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 is how you'll get promoted this is how you'll go to the next level by taking ownership of this and those two in my opinion are the, are the most effective ways creating value showing them why it helps their business and making it personal how to get to that next step but he said a very important word urgency if you do not create a time limit urgency give only two choices this sari or this sari i'm not going to show you any more you don't need any more we've been through it all you know everything else is much worse you know it's not up to your standard you know but you know every time you know the 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 buyer is trying to kind of figure out a way to get out of the situation of answering i'm not going to buy So that is very stressful for any human being. If you, if somebody has spent an hour, you know, being nice to you and so on, you already feel indebted, obligated, right? The word obligated to that person, and uh, most people have that window of vulnerability. And at that time, if you don't close, uh, the opportunity is gone, right? So. It's the same thing you actually create in a business environment. So, 
you create that trust advisor, all that by doing needs assessment, doing a project proposal, by doing a demo, by doing flying in your CTO, by doing all of these things are creating, uh, you know, a sense of obligation on part of the champion, on part of the team or the part of the committee. And at that time, I've seen some salespeople uh, say, you know, right when you should be asking for the order as to by creating the sense of urgency and or, and, or by saying that, you know, uh, uh, you know, we need to get this thing done here by, by this time. Because after this, my whole team is going to go and be working on something else or whatever it is. You, you have to create your logic. Uh, because in sales, everything has to be logic driven. Uh, it's not fluff. You've got to create logic to support every statement that you make. Right? So don't think that you know, these uh, salespeople are just talking nice words. It's not nice words. It's nice words with logic behind them, right? So, so the whole idea is that you try to figure out the logic to get the order. Right? So you've made them feel obligated. Then you put a time. Uh, then you give them limited choices and say, do you want the high-end solution or the, or the low-end solution? Do you want something that will give you a quick solution and then we'll do phase two, phase one, phase two? Or we can do the whole thing in one shot, but it'll be a little bit more time. But you give them limited number of choices, and you drive it to a purchase order. And that is, uh, those are the two elements to answer your question as to what needs to happen during a sales cycle. Yeah? In, in the sales cycle where the, uh, the sales person gets its mind share and says, all right, thumbs up, let's move forward, and then you sort of move into actually terms with the PO, do you find that that's when somebody else that may not have a conflicted interest of getting the deal done, just a commission check and perhaps a steeper discount starts to get involved, or do you empower the salesperson to continue to try to close all those things? Yeah, so the question was, okay, now under the heat of the pressure of feeling obligated, you know, the committee or the deci decision maker has gone ahead and said, okay, I'm going to order, buy this for $150,000, and you shake hands on that, right? And now, any transaction of this size, there'll have to be a contract or some legal document, right? Or there needs to be a PO that needs to be sent from the purchasing department. And obviously, you know, uh, that requires other people to get involved in the transaction. So there's a whole bunch of activities. The sale is not done when you shake hands. Uh, the sale is not even done when you get the PO. Uh, the sale is not even done when you ship the product and you've collected the money. It's really an ongoing, continuous support of the psychological decision that was taken to buy a product that has to be maintained in the organization, among all the different stakeholders. So the purchasing department should feel that, yes, there is a time limit by which I need to get this thing done. If I don't get the PO in, so the purchasing department needs to know that if they don't send the purchase order in by this particular time, uh, then by the time, you're, they're going to delay the whole project. And so all of that has to be communicated to the purchasing guy in a proper way, in, in something that is you know, business appropriate, right? Uh, same thing with the VP of finance, the guy who's saying that, hey, I got to check my budget. You know, I don't have time to look at the budget. You know, all that stuff. The sales guy has to go there and explain as to why this thing needs to be a high enough priority activity for the VP of finance to go ahead and approve it, right, uh, in, in a timely manner. So all of those things that selling has to continue. So getting past the committee decision and shaking hands on the deal or the major items of the deal, yet if sales guys cannot handle the additional detail work that is needed to really bring the deal in, uh, there's 101 reasons why the deal can uh, fall on its face, it can, can suddenly disappear. Because, you know, uh, the competition can wake up, uh, the market conditions might change, 
Um, you know, somebody might say that, do we really need to start this project right now? Is that deadline that we have got to do this project, you know, that important right now? Uh, why don't we wait for a few months? Because I think I've heard that there's some new technology coming. The VP of Engineering might say that, you know, I've heard that there is, I just went to a conference and somebody showed off this new, great new technology. So 101 reasons why if the salesperson doesn't keep continuously selling uh, in the organization and getting the whole thing closed out. And uh, so that's why you again need the big game hunter. And uh, all the relationships that have been built up over two years, over two years, the big game hunter is not only talking to the committee, he's also making a list of who's, who else he's going to need. He's going to need the purchasing guy. He's going to need the legal guy. He's going to need to know the secretaries of all these guys. He's going to need to know the VP of finance. He's going to you know, know the, know, need the support staff. He needs to know uh, the whole organization and, and how it works uh, so that you know, after he wins the deal at the committee level, he can get the deal all the way through the organization. Anything to add? Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, you know, you, it, it, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop when, when the deal is in procurement or, you know, handshakes have happened. And, you know, just to add to what Raj said to your point, uh, the guy who, you know, a good salesperson has anticipated what the potential roadblocks can be and has already worked through that. You know, frankly speaking, uh, in a large size deal, I will actually remove the ability of the salesperson to negotiate at that point because you also want to, there will be some, you know, you give it to procurement, procurement gets paid based on how much they can remove off the deal. That's how they get paid. So you want, to, you, you want to push back as well. So, you know, you, you want to make it tough for the salesperson to agree to something and you know, maybe come back and make it a little, little tougher for procurement to get past things done also. So there are different strategies depending on the type of, the type of sale. If it's a big deal, you want to make it a little tougher. If it's a small deal, you want to push it through quickly. So it's just, it really depends on the, on the sales cycle. So just a quick question on that. As a salesperson, when do you really decide from being friendly, really solving the problem, to taking the posture saying, hey, you are taking way too much time, it's not closing. How do you do that? Because some of my engagements uh, have come to that stage for one reason or the other, correct? It's quarter end, push it off to the next quarter, or something like that. But uh, you can't also be eternally patient, right? Sure. You can't also be eternally a nice guy. So when do you decide saying, hey, Raj, uh, uh, you're giving me a runaround. You need to close this PO. How do you say that? So you've got to first, there has to be a business case to it, right? They've got, there's got to be metrics, there's got to be an ROI, there's got to be a need that has been defined and accepted by the prospect or the to-be customer. So you and whoever, or the sales rep and whoever is selling understands that. So you have to have that mutual agreement first. You know, this is something you want implemented in, in, in January, which means we need to start, you know, implementation now. So we, I, we need 60 days to do that. So we have that time frame to do it. They start pushing through, you know, then you have to say, hey, this will move out. I've spent this much time. I've spent these many resources. You're going to miss your deadline. You have to make it, I think you have to push it a lot on them. Uh, and then frankly, you, you know, some people take a stance. I'll give you a story of Raj. Uh, this was when we were, at, uh, we were um, uh, doing the Dell deal and they came back with some absolutely ridiculous uh, numbers and basically said, you either agree or don't agree. And, you know, as a young sales guy, my initial thought was, great, let's agree and let's move the deal forward. I don't know if you remember this, Raj, or not. <laughs> but Raj basically said, you know, yeah, let's tell them we're done. And I sat there going, oh, my God, what, what, what's gone into my CEO? I'm going to kill my commission check here. No, but, the thing but, is, but like, you it know. Was right, it was the right, uh, right decision because they came back because they understood that, you know, there were certain dates, there were certain timelines, there were certain criteria which they were not fulfilling. Yeah, so in, in this particular case, now that you just refresh my memory, I think, See, purchasing guy's job is to try and bring the vendor down, right? Yeah. And uh, we had struck a deal for $10 million license fee. So, you know, the procurement guy says, hey, I'm sure I can knock 10% off or 20% off. Yep. I can make it $8 million. And if you look at the sales guy in my company, you know, he's getting, say, 10%. And he's worked two years for it. And he's going to look at it and say that, okay, instead of getting a million dollars, I'll get $800,000. Yeah. 
I think I'm quite happy with $800,000 commission check, right? So he is going to be okay with that uh, $8 million deal, right? So on the other hand, in this Dell particular case, uh, I had a direct pipeline to Michael Dell. And I knew that Michael Dell was not accessible to the procurement guy who was negotiating with my team. So Michael Dell had already agreed at the $10 million level. He said, okay, you got the deal. You know? And, but the procurement guy was trying to play hardball uh, and you know, cut the price down by $2 million or something like that, around $2 million or something like that, whatever it is. But I knew that this procurement guy had no access to reach Michael Dell. He's like 10 layers below Michael Dell. Michael Dell is running a multi-billion dollar company. He's not going to futz around with the procurement guy who calls him up to say, hey, I can save $2 million if you give me three more days to negotiate with this vendor. He's, he's got no ability to do that. So, you know, that is really the confidence I had in the deal so that I could say, look, the deal will come. And, you know, they sent us a contract with $8 million. And, you know, we were a small company. $8 million was good money, you know. But on the other hand, you know, I had the confidence that, you know, I had the, done the executive level selling. So since I'd done the executive level selling, I just you know, faxed it right back and said, no, uh, this is not the number that we had agreed to. And, uh, you know, it's $10 million is the deal. And, you know, they, uh, they basically kept us, you know, uh, on the tender hooks for another, like, you know, till the last 10 minutes or something before, you know, the deal had to come in. And then finally fax machine started rolling and cut, 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 and the number is $10 million, <laughs> right? That's exactly how it happened. Because we were going public and, you know, uh, I wanted to have this deal in the prospectus. And to have it in the prospectus, I needed to have a hard copy of the purchase order which showed the $10 million. So, because, you know, I was also building my story for the IPO roadshow. That, hey, I got a $10 million deal from Samsung. I got a $10 million deal from Dell. There's uh, all the Fortune 100 companies or the global 500 companies, every one of them is going to have to pay me $10 million. So I'm going to be a monster company and so on. And so I had a, I couldn't say one, one person bought for 10, another bought for 8, another bought for 6. Another. So I, I, I was trying to also achieve some of my own objectives about uh, the transaction. Right? So, so, but the point is that if you've done the proper sales process, inside the whole company, only then you'll have the confidence to see that your deal doesn't get delayed, it doesn't get nibbled away, it doesn't, you know, open the, you know, it doesn't get pushed out forever, all that stuff. Yeah, so just to add to that, to so give you guys a different perspective on that, yeah. you know, just to give a little bit more depth, the key there was, as, as Raj said, there was so much value created. So just to give an idea of what the value to Dell meant, why $2 million for Dell didn't mean much. Yeah. You know, so Dell built its entire business on supply chain efficiency. That's what the Dell Direct model was all about. So when we were having the ROI discussion uh, with, with Dell, the, 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 the basis was we will shave off half a percent of inefficiency in your supply chain. Half a percent. That's worth hundreds of millions of dollars to Dell. Yeah. So in reality, $2 million doesn't mean that much in their business. But we had created that value so that, you know, Raj was comfortable enough to go and say that, hey, we are worth $10 million to you, and we're not going to stand for that $2 million loss. And yes, the contract came in. Yep, came in at the last okay. minute. The other side of it, what I'm also in consulting and sales, so uh, knowing your customer environment better, what you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, understanding their architectural roadmap, they also have deadlines to meet. If you get hold of their architectural roadmap, yeah. you pretty much know that what's coming down the pipeline and what are the timelines. Other their budget approval cycle. If they don't exhaust their budget now, it's gone. Yep. Uh, so department generally has a pressure to go yep. uh, spend. 
Yeah, these are all excellent points that uh, you know a salesperson better have a good understanding of. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My question is that all this concept you're talking about demand creation, understanding, and going and meeting a customer to do all the different selling kind of selling makes sense for B2B. Can you explain somewhat how do you do the selling or demand creation for B2C market, specifically where you don't even see the customer? Like it's like a Right. mobile application or internet marketing and stuff like that. So how does a demand, a demand creation or, yeah. or selling works in those markets? So if you remember the very first slide that we put up, so it talked about all the different kinds of selling that is possible, right? And uh, essentially, if you have a product where there's low value-added selling, so if it costs like $10 and you're just selling it for $11, so it's a commodity like a... Uh, uh, cost-driven pricing. In those particular cases, uh, direct sales doesn't make sense because they, you can't generate enough value for a human being to go ahead and participate and do all this complex selling, right? So in that particular case, you have to use other techniques. You've got your viral marketing, you've got bundle selling, you've got you know, partner selling, you've got all these other systems that are also available for selling. Or if it's just a commodity product, you can just find distributors, will stock it, then your marketing guy generates the demand for the product, and they, all that the customer wants to know is, go to Walmart and pick it up, or go to Wiley and pick it up, you know. So that's, so it's How basically... The demand creation work? Uh, so the demand creation is created by, you know, uh, essentially, you know, putting in advertisements that, you know, uh, now we've got a PC that can give you graphics that is, you know, 30% faster, which is what NVIDIA does all the time, right? Or gaming can be better or whatever. Or the response time of uh, the paddle can be better. So all of those are marketing-driven demand creation, right? not sales-driven demand creation. Yes? Hi, I have a specific <coughs> question about a specific objection. Yeah. When a startup is selling to the likes of Dell, right, um, even after you create a value, if the risk profile of the decision maker is not very high, a typical objection that comes is that, are you viable? Yeah. Uh, when I was telling to ask.com, they actually had a slide which said that, what if you go bankrupt? <laughs> so the only answer I have is that escrow and all that, but even beyond that, say, okay, fine, your code is an escrow, escrow, but that's not helping me much. So how do you handle that specific assumption when you start up selling to a bigger enterprise, which does not have the risk profile? Yeah, so this is probably one of the most uh, common objections that comes for a startup. And every startup has to go through the hurdle of, are you viable, right? So that is, and especially the more mission critical the application, the more this question comes up. And, and actually, it even comes up for slightly less mission critical because whoever buys your product doesn't want to be left holding the bag if you go under. Right? So, so basically, uh, every entrepreneurial startup will have to face this viability issue. And, you know, there are many, many ways in which you solve the viability issue, you know. So, <clears throat> uh, basically, you know, if you have venture capitalists, then typically a VC-run company, a VC-funded company is regarded as having a little bit more staying power than a other company. Then the other thing is you can do partnerships. Then you can have service organizations like Accenture or Infosys or, ta or somebody like that partner with you so that, you know, they are the ones who are going to, they are going to be around a thousand times bigger than you. And uh, they kind of uh, take the responsibility of seeing that the product will work. And you sign an escrow agreement so that if you go under, your source code is accessible to them for modifying, deploying, et cetera. Or, so, you know, you use somebody else's credibility to get you in, right? So, and over time, you know, once you win a first deal, second deal, references start helping. So, it's just a process. So, uh, you will face that objection. Uh, no reason to get a heart attack when you face the objection, because you know it's going to be there. In fact, uh, one of the things that uh, I want to show, teach is that, you know, Essentially, a lot of preparation is required before every sales call. Before you meet the customer, you have to prepare. 
and you have to prepare and you've got to have answers to all the hard questions you're going to face. And if you've just given some thought to it, you'll be able to answer it much better than if you try to answer it you know, by just whipping out an answer on the spot. So, uh, for example, like, you know, one of our early deals at Selectica was BMW Germany, so that we could configure every BMW. Obviously, high-risk situation for the German customer uh, sitting in Munich to deal with a company that had five employees. And all the cars were going to be configured with our software. So, basically, like, you know, uh, they actually sent one of the top engineers to Selectica. And, you know, uh, we had to basically go ahead and reassure him that, you know, we were going to be a company that's viable and that has got, you know, lots of uh, uh, reasons why it's not going to go under, right? So we basically ended up creating, because we knew he was coming, we ended up, you know, creating uh, all the reasons and organizing all the reasons why he should feel comfortable with. So, for example, we did something called THUD marketing. So THUD marketing is, you know, we took all the patents that my CTO had and all the documentation that we had and created a pile of documents that was this thick to show that, you know, it wasn't just the software. There was this much of research done over 15 years that was supporting this technology. And that the commitment behind Selectica was not just a six-month-old company. It was 15 years worth of our CTO's life, which was industry, and he was an industry guru that supported this technology. So, you know, in three days, he got convinced, and then based on that thing. So the thing is that preparation is the key to answering tough questions that you'll face. But, you know, you do something that, you know, in sales we call Ben Duffy. If you, I think we did it. At, okay. So Ben Duffy is like, you know, you basically get your team, and you give everybody a role to play. Okay, you're going to be the VP of engineering on the other side. You're going to be the design manager on the other side. You're going to be the marketing guy on the other side. You're going to be the finance guy. And, you know, the guy who's selling has got to face all the questions that these guys were playing the role of what the customer's committee is going to form or be formed of uh, in the, uh, before, before he goes into the real meeting. So that kind of role playing uh, is really what prepares you to, you know, handle all the situations that will come up. Yeah. I have a question in continuation of that, or maybe even in your case. So you're a startup selling to a big BMW. So what if I say, okay, you are giving your supporting material saying that I have 15 years of experience and all this, um, you know, I found up this project for you. What if you say, I want to do test drive, you know, do it free for me. How would you react? You know, this is the startup is We are not, you are not validated exactly. So, what is what is your stand for anybody? Okay. So one thing you'll find is that big companies hate free. You know, when when you when a small company offers something for free, it means that you know, uh, it's nobody cares about it. Success or failure is not important. And that you don't really value your own product. So, and, and you know, they have the ability to pay. And when you offer free to somebody who's got the ability to pay, means that, you know, uh, it's not worth anything. So, I personally don't particularly care for, uh, you know, doing something for free. The only thing I'll do for free is I'll do a pilot for you. The pilot will belong to me. It will not belong to you after, at the end of it. And uh, you're going to have to give me all your proprietary data about your product, et cetera, and, uh, in order for me to build the pilot. But I'm going to keep the rights to the pilot so that, you know, uh, with the intention of getting the customer obligated to me. 
right? So I'm basically going to do a free one because I want to create obligation on the other side. And the smart, you know, the seasoned executives or CIOs on the other side are actually going to be totally aware that you're going to make them feel obligated and they'll say, no, we'll pay. They'll actually say, we will pay and we will keep the IP. You know, because once they pay, then the IP becomes there. So, so, uh, so the thing is that uh, uh, don't use free uh, unless you're going to use it in a very specific way. Okay, we should move on. Okay, guys, and I'm sure the question opportunities will come. Okay, okay this is an important slide because um, essentially, you know, uh, this talks about uh, how the management of a company, of the sales management person, person who's managing all the resources of the company, is going to decide, you know, how he's going to invest his sales development uh, resources. This is really important because at any given point in time, every sales guy will have 10, 15, 20 accounts that are going to result in a PO tomorrow. You know, that's his job. The sales guy's job is to convince his management that his 20 deals are all going to be resulting in a PO in the next month, you know, this month, by, by month end. And uh, because, you know, uh, the company only has resources to support uh, the sales cycle in maybe just 5% uh, of all the deals that these salespeople put in front of you, right? So the important thing is for sales management to know which five deals, which 5% of the deals they should put resources behind. Should, you know, if there are 100 customers, can you, or prospects, can you do 100 pilots? You can probably do four or five pilots, you know, if you've got 10 apps engineers or 10, uh, you know, technicians or whatever. So basically, um, uh, the organization itself is resource limited in terms of which deals it's going to really go after, right? Because as I said, before every sales call, you're going to have to go ahead and do planning for the team. So actually, before any sales call, uh, the salesman needs to call a team meeting almost a week or two weeks ahead so that he can prepare the right presentation, the right demos, the right ROI analysis, the right metrics, the right, you know, uh, delight factor at the, end of, uh, at the end of the sale. So all of that has to be prepared before, by the time he goes and does his transaction, gets his meeting. And the sales management's job is to assess all these deals on these uh, six parameters. The number one is, how good a job has the sales guy done about assessing the pain in the organization. How well has he sold uh, and cre created that demand and need for the product? So understanding, you know, uh, uh, whether the pain has been well documented and the, how the solution of the company can solve that pain, right? So that's number one. Number one, number two is qualifying the prospect. Does his budget, you know, his timing, all of that is in place or not? And what is, is it validated or not? Then it's like, who's the competition? Sometimes, you know, you don't want to take on the competition. Let him have a deal. Because there, you know, it's better to sometimes go after easier deals. And sometimes you say that, okay, for this one deal, you know, I want to break into the telecom industry, I have to take this guy on head to head. And I'm going to go ahead and bet the company to break the competition's hold on the telecom market or whatever. So uh, uh, figuring out the competitive situation. Um, then the decision-making process, as you saw the decision-making process, many stakeholders, many people trying to participate in that decision. Um, then like, you know, the person who's got the ultimate power 
to make the decision. Sometimes the VP of engineering, sometimes the VP of marketing, sometimes the VP of finance, sometimes the CEO, sometimes like a, a manufacturing director. I mean, it could be anybody, uh, depending on the customer situation. So knowing who has the power, everybody has got some power, but who has the real power to go ahead and make this transaction happen? And then, you know, <clears throat> being able to pull together your team to go ahead and make the transaction. So <clears throat> the sales guy's bigger job very often is selling within the company rather than selling to the customer because the company can make one sales guy's deals happen and another guy's sales deals not happen because he just doesn't get the support from the company. Any yeah, comment? No, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a story at Oracle. Our biggest competition was Oracle internally, for example. So many different deals happening, you know, getting pricing, getting strategy, getting you know, the right resources to, to just take a long, long time. So you had to convince internally to get, you know, internally get the alignment first. But, but you know, these points are very, very valid. And it's very easy. I mean, for me, number five is, is key, is selling to power. If you want to put resources into an opportunity, the sales rep should have the confidence to go back to the executive buyer and say, look, this is what I'm willing to invest to show you that I'm the right solution for you. Very good. And in order to do that, I, I'm, we're willing to do this. But in order to do that, I need something from you. It's a give and get. I need for you to have a conversation with my you know, senior executive so they can give me these resources. And a very easy way to see if the person goes, no, 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 I don't want to have that conversation. Well, you know where the deal really stands then. If they come and say, you know what, I'm more than happy to have a quick conversation and, 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 and walk them through kind of what our plan is and show them that this is something that's very important to us. And then you, know, you have that alignment that makes this much easier to do. So anytime we have to put resources in, for me, number five is key, is having that executive to executive relationship where we know that they are serious and they know the resources we are putting in. Because without that alignment, you won't go too far. Do you ever run into situations where maybe the product you're pitching to the CIO essentially, uh, the right pitch should be the CXO, so CEO, CFO, but because the CIO is not comfortable bringing it up or thinks it'll just be more work for him to integrate or whatnot, he just doesn't want to push it through? And then how do you? All the time. I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, that's when, you know, then you have to make a decision. Is, is, is that a deal you want to go after? The worst thing you can, there are lots of opportunities out there. The worst thing is to spend resources on the wrong one. And, you know, that, that becomes a decision that, that, that any manager or person running a company has to make. Is that the right opportunity to go focus on? But it's a very common occurrence, what you just mentioned. Okay, so let me spend, uh, let's spend the last five or ten minutes on... The RFP, RFQ process, because there are some key messages that I want to get across. Because uh, startups, you know, will be getting RFPs all the time. Because that is something that, you know, typically every customer, <clears throat> especially for a medium to big size deal, <clears throat> has to get multiple vendors to quote. And then they choose one. Now, the first point I'm trying to make is that if, as a startup, you're invited to quote on a request for proposal, you know, the deal was already lost. And you are there just to be, uh, what do they call them? Column fodder. Column fodder. Co uh, yeah, column fodder. So you want to be a column and fodder. So, <laughs> so you're called column fodder. So you're one of the three columns. And these are the reasons why I'm buying from this, because he's got yes, 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 yes. And you got yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And the last one, most important, might be company viability. And you always know on that <laughs> being a startup, right? So, and very often, just on that one no, you can lose, you know, they, they knock you out. And uh, you they don't even give you a chance to get over that no. So the point is that uh, startups will face, will basically end up losing, you're saying about, 90% but, uh, of the deals where you quote to an RFP response, in my opinion, it's probably 99.9%. .9%. Almost all deals you're going to lose. Now, the question is, why fill out an RFP when you know you're going to lose the deal? Because essentially what has happened is that your competition actually was brought in on a consulting basis 
to write the RFP. Your competition actually wrote the RFP. Because no IT department or no customer has the time or the resources to actually write a request for proposal. So typically they hire one of the, the guy who's going to win the deal anyway to write the consulting, uh, write the RFP uh, document and then um, send it out for bidding. And uh, essentially, you know who's going to win. The guy who wrote the document. So <clears throat> basically, um, why do you go ahead and respond to an RFP? So the reason why uh, at Selectica and other companies we've decided we'd uh, respond to RFPs because even though we know we're going to lose, is because the RFP is probably the best document of the product requirements, of your product requirements. It basically tells you what your product requirements are from a competition standpoint. It tells you, if you read between the lines, where the competition is strong. And it tells you you know, you need to have a reporting system, you need to have this kind of uh, database supporting it, this kind of sorting capability, this kind of whatever it is. So you need these, uh, so the RFP actually gives you a roadmap to how you should flesh out your product because most startups have only a limited amount of a sliver of the total solution. They don't have the total solution. The RFP gives you a idea as to what the total solution is expected by company, right? So, Essentially, you fill out the RFQ and, you know, you obviously try to win. But when you lose, essentially, you tell your team, because you don't want the team to be demoralized. You tell your team, look, we actually learned from this. And we got our product to improve so much without having to do all the market research to figure it out. We just got the answers in a silver platter. And um, so you lose and you learn. You lose and you learn. And after you've done this a couple of times, guess what happens? Suddenly you find that an RFP comes along and you can tick, 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 tick. I've got all my features already. So now you are in a position to say, okay, now I need to wage a competitive battle to take on the competition. Even though he wrote the RFP, I'm going to have to, I, I can take him on, okay? And that's where you have to use the Sun Tzu tactics and all that other stuff that that comes from a, from learning how to do competition to go ahead and surprise the competition because essentially after losing three four times, you will have figured out where your co uh, competition strengths are and their weaknesses are. Because every time you did a pilot, they did a pilot and they won, you, you figure out some more data about, you know, what is their real weakness. Because every, everybody's solution has some weakness or the other. Nobody is a perfect product. Just be, even Google search engine has got bugs in it and has got problems. People, point is that nobody has found them. Uh, if, you know, but they are there. We all know they are there. Otherwise, they would not have 100 people working on improving that product, right? But they just don't tell you that which are the bugs, right? So every product has problems. And the point is that, you know, competition's job is to know, figure out those problems, and then go ahead and exploit those weaknesses. So that is the competition. That is your job as a competitor. And you basically use the element of surprise in order to knock out the competition after you caught up with them. And uh, once you've done that, you know, if you keep executing your sales strategy in the right way, as we've been talking for the last uh, two hours, uh, you can actually create a selling organization that, you know, from that day onwards, just keep winning, right? So because you now have the best product, you know your competition, you know where you're superior to them. You've got a reference account. And, uh, and then you basically end up uh, you know, winning every deal. And I don't know if you were there at the sales meeting where essentially you know, I called a sales meeting after we 
won one of these surprise deals at GE Medical. And I told him, I brought the whole sales team in for sales training and said, okay, this is, these are reasons that we beat the competition. Where we had lost to them, you know, 10 out of 10. And then we finally won the 11th uh, uh, situation at the G Medical, but, you know, for very legitimate reasons. And then I brought the sales team in and said, okay, these are the reasons. And if any of you loses a deal to Calico, from this day onwards, you're fired, right? Were you there in the meeting? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I stayed, I, st <laughs> I stayed far away from okay. that one, I guess. No, no, but, but you beat Calico. You, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah you, many you, times. Yeah, yeah you, you never lost to Calico after that. Because none of, we never lost a single deal to Calico after that. Like they went bust. Yeah, till they yeah. went bankrupt. Here's yeah. a company that raised $100 million in an IPO a year before Selectica. And they went bankrupt a year later. Uh, because we never let them win a single deal uh, once we beat them fair and square at uh, G Medical. So, so basically, uh, you know, the RFP, RFQ process can be frustrating as anything, but it is a, it's something that can be, that needs to be used by startups in order to build, you know, a winning strategy, a winning product. How long does RFP take in your business? How, how long does RFP take in your business to, to to write an RFP, because for us, uh, if I have to write a proposal, it takes uh, at least six, to, six weeks to two months. That's so, exactly right. Like an RFP, writing the RFP itself is typically a three to six month process for a complex uh, business process or whatever, business solution. And uh, responding to it, they'll give you typically three months to do a pilot and another evaluation of another two to three months. So, so that's typically how it goes. You know, I... Do you have time? Sure. Yeah. Uh, then you're going to take the class from this point on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, because uh, so I've got to run home. I've got to go to a birthday party <laughs> for myself. <laughs> so, but, you know, I think you're in amazingly competitive, uh, competent hands. I think uh, Puneet is, you know, just from the days that, you know, I was working with him, you know, uh, I just loved his energy, you know. And uh, when I saw him at all of PC order in that booth, he was the only guy I wanted from that whole, or oh, everybody there because of his just energy and enthusiasm and so on. And uh, he's just grown, grown, grown where he's right now the top honcho, right? Uh, doing all kinds of amazing sales situations. So uh, all the slides are here. Okay. And uh, I think you can work through this competitive advantage and account <laughs> management and Dynamic strategy. Okay. okay. See, this is how we test our salespeople. Sure. <laughs> so you know, the, 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 there's a saying in sales that time can kill all sales, and I think this is what this slide is trying to talk about. Time can kill all sales. To add to that, you know, I, I, I'll tell you. Uh, initially, when I was when I had started selling, you know, it's 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 tough. Your Raj mentioned it. Going and asking for the order. It's a very difficult thing to do. In fact, I challenged some of my sales guys at times. I say, hey, guys, you know, somebody says they want to get into sales. I said, no problems. Go outside. Go and get 15 bucks from somebody. Just go try. Go outside. Get 15 bucks. It's not easy. Nobody will give you. All of a sudden, people start looking at their cell phones. Start, you know, they'll start doing different things because the last thing they want to do is, is give anybody money. So time is the killer of all deals. And the, what this slide is trying to talk about is when do you ask for money? When do you provide, um, you know, in the different stages of the sales cycle, if it's screening or decision making, or, or if you're trying to, in the acquisition phase, what should you be doing? If you go in very early on and you start talking about product, you will lose a deal because the customer is not ready for that. They want to validate if you're a small startup, if you're a viable startup or not. They want to validate what kind of technology benefits you have. You know, if you're later on in the sales cycle, you're at the uh, acquisition and, and uh, commod commodification, you know, that was a word, but okay, of, of the product, you know, and you're talking about product fit, you've lost the deal. If they do not know the value you add and how your product fits, you've lost the deal. So time kills all deals, but with that, doing the thing at the right, 
right part of the deal is critical. So, you know, uh, a, a, a good sales rep needs to understand when and how to deliver what aspect of the, of the value at the right time. And that's, that's key. So you've got to either work with your sales guys or if you are the sales guys, understand what is it that your customer wants? What do they want to hear from you? Uh, based on where they are, what will help move this deal forward? Um, and you know, deliver that at the right time. Any questions on this slide specifically? How do you know when it's the right time? That's what you have to figure out. I mean, you have to understand what the customer is, where, where the prospect is. You know, um, I'll give you an example and tie into the last slide that Raj left us with. You know, uh, uh, at Selectica, there was a deal we were doing with, uh, with uh, it was first USA at that time. Now it's the uh, bank, I think it's a bank, credit card division of Bank One, if I remember correctly. And they were looking at configuring cards, credit cards. And, you know, this is a bank, didn't know anything about configuration. So I met with their, I think it was SVP of, of I'm not sure of what division, but, you know, he said, yeah, we're looking at configuration, but we have no idea about configuration. So I said, hey, you know what? You know, Raj talked about the guy who had that, that big book of 15 years of work. I said, well, he's considered the father of configuration. So how about he come in and I won't be there because I'm a sales guy, I'm biased, but let him come in and help you understand what configuration is. That's what they needed at that time. They needed to understand what the hell is, somebody told, them, Accenture told them that they needed a configurator. So they said, okay, who are the configurators? Well, the Selectica, okay, Selectica, what can you do for us? They did not know what they needed. At that point, they need to understand how configuration, what configuration meant to them. They couldn't care less about the features functions. Price was not even an issue at this point. If we had started saying, oh, this costs three million bucks, they don't know if that's too high or that's too low. It was not the right time to bring it up. It was all about educating them, them about what configuration was. So Sanjay flew to uh, uh, Delaware and you know, talked to them about configuration. And then we wrote the RFP. So back to the last slide. We allowed us to write the RFP because they respected him, trusted him. But that's what they needed at that time. Depending on the sales cycle, you know, let's forward three, four, five months after that. Now they're looking at saying, great, okay, we understand we need a configuration solution. You know what, there are two vendors we're looking at. Now we want to understand which one's gonna get us what we need at the right, at the right you know, speed and make sure we're successful. Then you wanna talk about scalability, you wanna talk about resources we have. They don't care about feature functions anymore. It's the last thing on their mind. They've already gone through that evaluation. So the key is do things at the right time and make sure you're doing the right thing at the right time. Does that answer the question? Say in a complex sale, there are, say, six stakeholders. You've been able to convince four or five. But the last minute, somebody, you know, puts up an obstacle, says, we may not need it now. There are other alternatives. Then how do you handle those kind of objections at the very last minute? Which come up in a sure, I mean, that happens all the time. Happens in personal life, too, right? Um, I mean... Yeah, like you've done, you sold everybody, including CEO. Sure. At the last minute from some remote office, some... Some different division. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, you, you've got to know, I mean, that's where there, there are multiple, this one this slide didn't talk about was, who are the different people in a sales cycle that you have to interact with, right? There's somebody called your executive sponsor. This is a guy you go to and say, hey, buddy, help me understand what's needed, what's next, how do I go by this person? He'll say, hey, this person is being a problem, give me this data so that I can go and sell it to him. You know, uh, this person who's your close ally in the deal. You know, there's, there's somebody called the, the, the executive sponsor, usually the budget holder, uh, the person who will write the ultimate check, sign the ultimate document. Uh, there's somebody called a fox who tells you what you want to hear, but in reality is there just to kill the deal. He's looking at, you know, another solution. He or she's looking at another solution. They just want to give you all the information so you think you're doing well. The key in the scenario that you identified was finding the right, the right person, building that relationship and saying, hey, this is the problem I'm facing. If you have created value, you know, and Raj did that at Dell, as I said, as, as we talked about, um, somebody came in, the procurement came in and said, we're going to give you $2 million less. I was happy. I'll take $8 million. I was very, very happy. But Raj said, no, I'm not going to take that. And, you know, he... he um, 
he he said no, and you know we, there were lots of other calls. He didn't describe the whole thing, but there were a whole bunch of calls that happened. Uh, eventually, uh, went uh, all the way up to Michael Dell, and he pushed in and said, "No, I want this deal done." So it's about leveraging the resources that you've built in situations like that, which is why relationship is key, and multiple types of relationships. So you know, so uh, one of the things uh, which which I've observed so far is that uh, all the deal sizes seem to be you're talking of you know several million dollars. Now you know I was at a conference a couple of years back, and there one of the CIOs said that like uh, five years back, if I went to my board with a five million dollar proposal, they would pat me on my back. But if I go today, they'll pat yes, me. Absolutely. So, so my question was, you know, with all this world of SaaS happening, and you know, companies like Workbase, I don't know what Workbase pricing is, but probably it's like fifty dollars a license or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. of that sort. Mm -hmm. so how has sales changed? Absolutely. You know, honestly, you know, a lot of these slides and a lot of the t gear track was geared on very big enterprise selling. But, you know, a lot of that has changed. It really has. Uh, you know, if you look at SaaS and how SaaS has kind of come into play these days, a few things have happened. SaaS has enabled volume. You know, the good old days, when you, know, you go and you do one deal every, every two years, uh, has changed. Today, people are doing, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 deals a month. Velocity has changed. You, know, you no longer have annual quotas. You have monthly quotas. You know, the whole sales team alignment has changed. Most of my team is inside sales based. It's no longer, today an inside sales role is actually a, a nice role to have. I remember when I was started selling, the last thing you wanted to be called was an inside sales guy. You always wanted to be in the field. These days, look at Salesforce, 85% of their sales guys are inside sales guys. That's where you want to be. So SaaS has made a huge change in the, in, in the market space of how sales happens. You know, now teams are doing, I mean, made, teams are doing smaller deals, doing them faster, and doing them repeatedly. So you, you're absolutely right. It's completely changed. Um, and the way you structure a sales team has changed. Um, you know, the way you, the type of salespeople have changed. It's, it's, it's you know, finding younger, hungrier people. Uh, you do still do, do need those big uh, deal makers for some of the larger, more complex transactions. Um, but fundamentally, if you look at the work days, the net suites, the sales forces, you know, all of these SaaS, even my company, LifePerson, uh, the type of salespeople have definitely changed to adopt to a, to a SaaS, SaaS uh, you know, kind of a sales process. The process has changed. Um, the, way, the way we do demand generation has changed. And I can jump in and talk about any one of those, but you're spot on. It's a very different sales model today than where it was five, five years ago. You, today, we don't do... You know, the, the Comcast deal I was talking about, that'll be the biggest deal, that, well, yeah, in the last two to three years the company has done. Our average selling price is $35,000, $40,000. And those are considered, you know, pretty good sized deals in, in SaaS today. So, we need, uh, what has changed from the uh, revenue forecasting, as you're talk, touching the demand generation, revenue forecasting from being a product selling now to this new norm of SaaS? Yeah. How do how are you really doing the prediction? Sure. So when you when you when you were you know in the, in the good old days as I like to call them you know you'd go sell a big deal you'd, let's, let's just say you sold a five million dollar transaction you know and then you have a fifteen percent maintenance every year for the next however many years you use us that's what you forecast right um, nowadays you go sell a you know one thousand dollar a month deal so it's twelve thousand dollars a month and that's what you forecast but you can forecast that twelve thousand dollars every year right. So the way you look at uh, customer lifetime value has changed. And frankly speaking, that $1,000 deal, you know, you've got to make sure, and Raj mentioned this, selling doesn't stop once, once you close the deal, once a handshake happens, once the money comes in, once it's implemented. You've got to put more resources to make sure they're happy, make sure they go in and, and, and renew again. Salesforce had a 94% renewal rate at one point. They knew if they closed a customer, they could continue to get that annual contract value or more for 94% of their customers. So the whole economics of SaaS has, uh, or SaaS has come in and changed the whole economics of how you look at, look, at, uh, look at forecasting, which is why Salesforce can put such a high, I mean, if you look at Salesforce, if you look at their, their, their financial statements, they're putting very high cost of sale, right? which is why they're not even profitable yet, even though they do $4 billion in sales. Because they know they can, they can continue to put resources and know that they will get that same dollar amount or more for many, many, many years to come. 
terms of the. Uh, how do you? How do you sell through? I mean, how do you structure the deal? How do you initiate the deal in a situation where, for example, we go and tell Bank of America that we would really like you to sell this product to all your high net worth individuals whose bank balance is one million plus or something. So how do you handle such situation? I mean, that's a very consultative sale, right? If somebody is, is, I mean, I haven't got any of those calls yet, so someday hopefully I will. But if, if somebody is, is uh, you know, selling to somebody who's, who's a very high net worth individual, you know, you've got to have somebody who's credible enough. You can't just put a guy out of school or somebody who's just, you know, comes in and says, oh, yeah, yeah, I can make you a lot of money. But you want somebody who understands the market, understands, you know, the value of that money. It's a very consultative sale. How do I send it to Bank of America? That I want Bank of America to sell this to all their clients. Are, are, you, are you providing the, the technology, the service? Uh, technology, yeah, I mean, you have to, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very open-ended question. I mean, you have to really, you, A, there has to be benefit to, to Bank of America. What does Bank of America make? I mean, they have, they have many people doing this today. So they have, to, they have to understand the value that your service or your product will provide. And how does it make them money? How does it help them retain customers? How does it help them grow the lifetime value of that customer? And if, if you can deliver that value, once again, in my opinion, the fundamentals of sales are creating value. If you can create value to Bank of America that your service will help them make more money, help, them, help their customers be more successful, help their customers stay longer with them so they'll provide more dollars as in lifetime value, then you have your value proposition. Yep. So, Puneet, uh, in this uh, roadmap, uh, at what point uh, do you pivot from saying this is the solution, this is the vision of where I will take you, but today I have a subset of this and I don't have the complete solution. So, at, and in the selling, you're selling the solution. Yep. But at what point then, you know, you come back out and you say, but let me tell you actually what I can deliver today. It's a great question. It's a great question. You know, you, you go in and you sell a value. Right? Let, let's all remember the first date we had, right? We go in and sell, oh, this is, you know, this is me and everybody, everybody's selling them. So, every, so first of all, everybody's a sales guy here. First time anybody went on a date, they were selling themselves. So everybody's a sales guy here. So, you know, you, you go and sell the vision, you know, whatever that vision is, right? But then you have to come to reality at some point. And the, that's what, I mean, that, that's all, that's what the art of the sale is. To understand when to bring a customer and say, this is where we can take you. We can take you, I don't know, let's think of a situation in Selectica's case, we can take you to Dell 100% ordering online with 0% uh, you know, uh, RMAs because manufacturing is 100% aligned to what's ordered online. That's a huge value proposition. Um, once I think the executives understand the value of what that can deliver to the company, then you want to say, all right, now let's look at this and say, what can we deliver in six months? What can we deliver in 12 months? Because it's not only technology. The company might not be ready to do the whole thing uh, from day one. So you have to align yourself to where the company is and say, this is where you want to go. How quickly can you get there? Well, we can get there from a product perspective in eight months, 12 months, 24 months. You can get there from a resource perspective in eight months, 24 months, you know, 12 months. And then you set the, set the, set the guidelines and then you hone down the sale to a product and, and a price. So assessing competitive advantages. So what I think this, this, this slide is trying to say is that there are competitive advantages across every aspect of, the, of, of, of who you're selling into. Right? There could be competitive advantages from a company perspective, from a services perspective, from a sales team perspective. You have to differentiate yourself uh, and provide that, that competitive advantage across every aspect of, of, uh, of you as a salesperson, you as a company, you as a product. So it's going through this list, for example, you know, uh, the company would be, you know, as I said, financial stability or the reputation of the company or, or just saying, hey, this is, this is a viable company. I mean, I, I can tell you some examples. You know, um, let, let, let's go to the SaaS world for a, for, for, for a few minutes. You know, um, the life person where we are right now, you know, we'll go in and say, you know, brand loyalty, we have 10,000 customers, right? 
300 of the top 500, the 300 of the top 500 retailers rely on us. And that brings, you know, we've got, you know, 20, we, we created the first chat solution in the market. That brings brand loyalty. So we can, we can drive that from a company perspective. Partnerships, talking about the, the partners that we can bring. You know, there's, there's no technology company can do everything. Oracle claims they can, they can't. That's the reality of things. There always will be gaps. So coming in and saying we have the ecosystem of partners, let that be from a product perspective or a services perspective to complete the, the overall solution, you know, shows differentiation in a, in, a, in, a, in a partner perspective at Oracle. That's how we competed against Salesforce. Saying, hey, we have this very large ecosystem of partners. You want an implementation partner or you need a technology partner. You know, we can bring all of these people in that Salesforce can because they're a small little startup. And you know that that that's how we differentiated our partner organization. Service is huge. Um, you know, just coming and saying, you know, we have we have the ability to be responsive when things go wrong. I mean, when when things are going great, everybody's happy. But when things go wrong, everybody you know wants immediate response. You know, I remember at at at, at a company like Selectica, being a small startup, this was huge. This was a big differentiator for us. Going in and saying you have direct access to the CEO. You know, here's, here is, here's our head of server. We would even bring, um, I was at a company the other day, a company called 8 by 8 in the communication space. They have a knock in the office, bringing customers in and saying, this is our network operating center. Come and see it. Anything happens, you know, here, the CEO sits on the, on the, on the floor above. Go and, you know, give him a call if something goes wrong. So knowing that we can make decisions fast, you have that access to power, access to responsiveness is huge. And frankly, that's a huge advantage for a, for, for a startup versus a big company. Imagine trying to get something done at Oracle. Customers would, you know, something, you know, service would be down. To get somebody to do anything was a, was a nightmare at Oracle. That's a huge advantage for a startup. Product solution, you know, um, just features functionality. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was at a SaaS company, a company called Blue Roads, and we brought in the first deal and we built a business around beating Salesforce in what is called PRM, Partner Relationship Management, which is an aspect of CRM. It's how do you manage an indirect sales channel? Um, and we did it because we had three or four features that Salesforce didn't have. How did we as a small company, we bought, we brought in the first, first customer and brought in the, I think the hundredth customer in a period of about two and a half years. Salesforce is big shop doing really, really well, roughly about seven, $800 million in revenue at that time. Um, but we had a few features that were critical to this market. Now, Salesforce had eight, ten different products. This was one that they, they had a couple of product managers. They had, you know, a development staff. But they couldn't go deep. Yet we could come in and say, you know, this is, this is how we do it. You know, deal registration, demand management for, for partners is very different than doing it in a direct sales team. And we were able to show deep functionality differences that, once again, is very strong from a, a, uh, from a startup versus a big company. So there are a lot, of, a lot of advantages when you're trying to differentiate yourself that a large company has, no questions asked. But honestly, I think there are more advantages a small company has when you're trying to differentiate yourself. The key is finding them. And key is knowing how to deliver them in a manner that makes sense to, an ex to, to somebody who's looking and evaluating your solution. I think you offer, I mean, pricing is amazing. I mean, and when you're a smaller size company, pricing just depends on what's going to win the deal. You know, I've seen larger companies have more price pressure and, you know, price constraints they have to work with at Oracle. You know, we had certain limits that we had to be under. You know, there are certain rules as a public company you can only give, you know, certain discounts or certain bands across all your customers, certain fair pricing agreements, et cetera. Smaller companies, those are not there. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, pricing really depends on value. If you can go and create value, you can, you, if you can go and create value, you have, you have the right to go and ask for price. If you cannot create value, you will, price, you will fight a pricing negotiation game. So startups, smaller companies, you have the ability to be more flexible on pricing. And that can be a huge competitive advantage. Not only pricing, but terms. You know, pay me X percent now, pay me X percent in, 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 in 60 days, pay me, pay me Y percent once certain deliverables are met. Companies like Oracle, as soon as a deal is done, I mean, at Salesforce, there's a joke used to be, we just sign the deal and 
Before we even sent you the thank you note, we've got the invoice in our, in our inbox. That's how fast they were to invoice customers. And you can't, that's it. You can't budge from that kind of, you know, you invoice day one. At uh, smaller companies, you might have a little bit more flexibility. So use that as a competitive advantage. But you have to create value before you can use price as a competitive advantage. I have a question here. So in the past, for example, for enterprise sales, the sales was one to one. So you uh, like uh, offered a value to one enterprise customer and offered one customized price, basically. Yeah. Now in SaaS model, yeah. you are offering a price for number of customers. Yeah. And for some, the value may be different. Yeah. For other, may be different. Yeah. But you're publishing a price, basically. So yeah. One price for all. Mm -hmm. And very difficult to change, basically. So in such new situations, how do you determine what is the optimum price for majority of the market? Because once you set a price, it's very difficult to change. Sure. Uh, even, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, frankly, it's a lot of trial and error. It's what, 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 will, what will people pay? Uh, and trying to set that beachhead. I remember at Salesforce when we, I, I, I helped them launch the first service cloud deal. My team was a, deal that, a, deal, a team that did the first service cloud deal for Salesforce. And we did not know where to price. It was brand new as a product. We did not know how to price. The force.com licensing. How do we price per interaction? That's something Salesforce never did. It was always price per user. How do, how do we price number of incidents coming in built on force.com, which is a service implementation? You just tried something. And, and you, know, you get one, two, three, four, five examples, and from there you try and get pricing. I remember our pricing was way out of whack. It was actually not public, not made public for a while until they were trying to figure out, is it you know, 10 cents an interaction or is it you know, a dollar an interaction? Uh, if you put a dollar interaction, we need to discount 99% uh, for most of our deals. If you're 10 cents, you know, we discount 80% most of our deals. So this went on back and forth for many, 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 many weeks before kind of finally the pricing came to norm before it was publicized on the website. How is the freemium model? Uh, I mean, is really good competitive advantage? Uh, is it a competitive advantage or not? Depends on what you're selling. Depends on the sales model. Sure, depends on the sales model. It depends what you're selling. If you know, the freemium model works primarily if you have a, a very long tail of, uh, you know, a lot of customers, a lot of products doing the same thing. And you want to differentiate, but you want to give them an avenue to try something. It, it, it's, freemium works when there's not a lot of uh, sales power needed, not a lot of human intervention needed. You cannot offer, you cannot offer a freemium model you know, here I'm going to spend six months selling to you or two weeks selling to you and then give you a freemium model because that cost of sale is very, very high then. So a freemium model works well and it works very, very well if you have high volume. So you have to have demand coming from the outside. You give something freemium, give them a 30-day chance to try it and then convert them. But then you've got, got to have the, the uh, understanding that you can get that conversion rate up. You know, if you can only convert 1%, then having a freemium model is of no sense. If you can convert... You know, 30, 40, 60, 70 percent, then maybe the freemium model makes sense. So it really depends on what you're selling. Salesforce cannot do a freemium model because it's just the cost of sale is too high. But you go to, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, uh, I, I helped uh, work with a company called Yammer for a while. I was, uh, was working with David Saxer for a while. The freemium model worked for them. That was their approach to entry. So it really depends on what the model is and what kind of audience and what type of a sales channel. So is that, have a does that mean that initially you have to have a low cost of serving our uh, self-service model uh, to be successful in a freemium model? That's my take on it, yeah. I don't think you can have a freemium model that's successful if your cost of sale is very high. I just think it, it's, 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 it's counterintuitive. That's my perspective. Yeah, and I think to combine that with uh, not only the cost of serving, uh, but actually fulfilling the first 30 days that you're giving away sure. for free sure. has to be a minimal cost. Absolutely. Uh, I've seen a couple of companies do it. Um, a lot of big companies are now also getting into it. Um, I can talk offline. On it. No, that's a good point, yeah. And the cost of sale is not just the cost of selling, but the cost of implementing it as well. You're spot on. I just have a comment uh, to Sanjay on that. Uh, I, I view the SaaS model as three parts. One is, what is the strategy for insertion and customer acquisition? Second is how you scale. And the third is how you add value on top of it. So if you are able to use the same SaaS, SaaS to me fundamentally is a delivery and 
lot, most of the benefits are for the vendor, right? right? Because they have single source, easy to maintain, all the benefits. But if you have insertion scale and value, you can give away portions of the insertion for premium. Uh, like for example, for my company in the IoT space, I might choose a 50 cents a deal or something like that as an insertion, right? Or for consumer, 10 cents for your phone. So that will become insertion, you acquire customers, you build a database, blah, 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 for marketing, demand gen, etc. Then your scale, where your price will linearly or non-linearly scale based on, it depends on the product. If your product has something which is a function of something that scales, mm -hmm. then you can go to the next level. And the third area where most of the SaaS companies are going is analytics, recommendation, and all those things. So I, I do believe premium has a place in the insertion market. Absolutely. And I have a point. So basically I can add to that point as well. So premium can also work when you actually are trying to test your product. So you will actually get certain users who are giving you input for because this is for free, but it, it helps you to build your product. So it's, it's a very, very good right. example when you want to test your product and you want some users to rely on their feedback. So premium works very well. It, it does. The, the, only, the only caution point I would add there, this is just from my experience, and you know, it's, it's, it's a newer model, but is once you set the precedence of free, at times it's tough to go upscale. So you either have to, either have, to have a differentiated product and say X percent is free or these features are free. In order to do this, you have to start paying. But I've seen some, some you know, people who've tried and say, All right, I'll give it to you for free for six, I mean, What's, let's look at Groupon. Yeah. Sure. 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 No, I, you're spot on. I mean, let, let, let's look at this. Some Groupon. I mean, if you go get a Groupon for a restaurant that gives you 50% off, I'm not going back there again and paying 100% because the mindset is set. I'm only going to pay 50% there. That's me. Sorry. Everybody else might be different. But that's, maybe that's what they see in me. I don't know. But I'm not going to pay 100% if I've gone there once and it's 50%. So it's a very viable model. You just have to be careful because I've seen it bite people as well where it's brought their price points down as well. It really improves the perceived value sure. of the product that they were. Yeah. I mean, because they are a brand, yeah. they couldn't monetize it. Yeah. The product is really great. It's a great product. Yeah. Yeah, they just couldn't monetize against Salesforce. You're right. I mean, they actually, I would say, were, the, were at one point the leaders in the space. And Salesforce is now, you know, we know where they are at. So this talks about effective account management. And, you know, an account deal can be initiated from any number of entry points. Um, and I can't stress this enough in kind of where SaaS is today and how SaaS deals are done. I mean, back in the day, you know, when, when we were doing big enterprise deals, the budget holder was always the CIO. The CIO controlled the budget for technology spend in a company, period. The CIO at one point was the most, was the strongest person in the company. Every technology decision had to go through this, this CIO. Today, I'll say it's a complete opposite. You want to approach a, 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 an account, CIO might be the last person you go through if you're trying to sell technology, frankly speaking. Because now SaaS has allowed you know, the business to monetize uh, your technology and, and leverage technology like has never been done before. You know, you're trying to sell a, sell a, a, a sales solution, an e-commerce solution, you can go through the CIO, you can go through the CEO, you can go through the head of sales, you can go through the head of online, you can go, frankly, to the head of marketing also. There are multiple ways to enter an account. So one thing that SaaS has done is made it much easier to access an account, leverage partners, leverage, you know, a, a sponsor, leverage, as I said, what we saw with Comcast, uh, we sent it to the CEO and said, hey, this is a problem you're having in your organization. CEO sent a note to the head of uh, customer service and said, these guys have a point. How come you didn't tell me about this? So the head of customer service said, well, thank you for you know, lighting a fire up my butt. Help me now and you know, make, make me at least you know, look, look, look decent in front of him. So there are multiple ways to enter an account. And a good sales guy knows how to do this. And I'm telling you, it's, there, there's no right or wrong. There's no minimum here. It's only where you're, you know, a good, not, a, not only a good sales guy, anybody who's trying to get into an account is what you can think of. And there's, 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 there's no rules here. I have seen, as I said, I've seen people follow, I, I think I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned this. I've seen people follow a certain person, seeing where they go eat, what they go shop, and become friends with them. 
and that starts off a, a conversation. You know, one, one thing Raj didn't mention is how he got into Dell. Um, I was, uh, he'd mentioned his story about, about um, uh, Louis Vuitton, but I was flying back. I used to live in Austin. I was in, I was in, uh, in uh, the Bay Area. I was flying back for, uh, for, uh, for a friend's wedding to, to Austin. And I had one, one up, uh, upgrade left on American Airlines. So I said, you know, do I want to take it on my way there or on my way back after I'm hungover? Maybe it's better to take it on the way back. So, you know, back in the day I could ask, I said, hey, you know, which, which, which is, uh, is, it, is a plane more full to Austin or is it more full on the way back from Austin? You know, many years ago they would tell you. And she said, yeah, there's one seat in first class next to a guy, Joe M., Joe Marenghi. I'm like, this is a guy I've been trying to call it Adele. He was a senior vice president. So I sat with him on the plane. Plane took off. And I said, Joe, I've been trying to get in, get in touch with you and you haven't responded to me in, in so many emails. And he was blown away. And you know, he thought I actually found a seat next to him. And that's what started the whole deal. My point is there's no right or wrong way to get to somebody. So getting, and this, this talks a lot about account management, but in each, the first point, account deal can be initiated from number of entry points that is completely true. Let your mind, I mean, good sales guys figure out a way to get to somebody. I'll tell you, the easiest thing today is getting to somebody. Social media or picking up the phone or, I mean, picking up the phone is tough. But social media, if, you, if somebody says, if a sales guy comes and says, I cannot reach somebody, they haven't tried hard enough. So, you know, just, you know, I would just like to kind of defer, you know, I tried a few months back trying reaching CIOs. Yeah. I found it next to impossible because they get like thousands of calls. Uh, so I, I just said something. Calling somebody is, 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 is not worth it. LinkedIn? LinkedIn, tweet, follow them. In five minutes, you'll get a response back. I have personally used it in the last 10 days. Yeah. What is that? Tweet. Find the person, follow them, know what they do. Uh, I, I, I know of a, of a technology that actually you, you put people into, into a circle. So you say, these are, the, you know, these are the five, six people I want to follow. I want to get in touch with these people. So you give them a name. They outsource the name to, to uh, some, some person in the Philippines will tell you, you know, this is their Facebook, this is their LinkedIn, this is their Pinterest profile. And you go in and you start following these people. And, you know, hey, hi, hi uh, John, how are you? You know, good to meet you. And just nothing. You might not get anything back the first day. Next day on Twitter, you retweet something they sent. You might not get something back the next day. You go on Pinterest, like something they've posted. And you do this over time, and you'll realize that someday you'll get a response back. So the companies that are doing this to help salespeople enter and get to know people who they don't know. So I agree with you. Calling somebody today, best of luck. Trying to deliver a, a message in, in, in you know, a 30-second voicemail is very, very difficult. So there are way more uh, appropriate ways to try and get a hold of somebody today. Sure. <laughs> sure. I'll tell you a deal at Salesforce. This was after I left. This, this made, uh, this, it was well talked about in the industry. Actually, uh, forgetting the guy's name, was an Indian chap. Uh, he wanted uh, to get into an insurance company. He actually became an agent of that company. So he became an agent of the company that he was trying to sell to. And I don't know if his... Somebody he knew had licenses for it, but he became an agent for them and worked with them for a year to figure out the problems and then went straight to the CEO and said, these are the problems. And I'm telling you this because I am was selling your stuff. And that, at that time was the biggest deal Salesforce ever closed. So it's very easy, very different approaches and methods to get into an account. And then once you're in the account, you know, uh, managing that relationship is, is obviously critical as well. Yeah. How, how has the account management changed from your Oracle days to the current? In the SaaS world, it has changed, right? Sure. The amount of uh, intimate meetings and contacts you have probably are fewer. Yeah. And the deal size is smaller. Yep. And, and you may not go up the chain all the time. Yep. Um, can you compare your sales Absolutely. stint at Oracle versus, say, your sales, sales stint now? Absolutely. In, uh, Absolutely. It's, it's changed dramatically. You know, Oracle, I remember we would go out, we would call it the Oracle bus. You had to have a blue suit on and you had to have a you know, tie on and everybody goes. And there were times you would go and the customer said, I don't think I have enough seats for you guys, let alone my guys. But you have the whole, you know, 10, 15 people going and you sit down and you have a full day QBR and you just you know, bore everybody to death, basically. 
but very high level, very high touch. You've got 10 people there and you touch this guy until they basically just don't want to talk to you. But you just keep on, keep on pressuring them. And once again, great organization. I'm nothing against those guys. But in today's world, it's very, very different. It's all metrics based. So I had mentioned earlier, the role of a customer success manager has come into play. And that to me is frankly the most important role when it comes to account management. These guys sit, have, you know, have dashboards and look at multiple criteria about an account. And account management fundamentally has changed. So back in the days, it was about, hey, this is who we are. This is what we provide. Please buy X, Y, Z. That was what the message was. Today it is, this is who you are. I am noticing this trend in your business. These three metrics don't seem right or can be improved. Hey, Mr. Customer, this is what you need to make those metrics improve. So at Salesforce, we used to have two or three customer success managers for every 10 or so sales reps. So these guys would go close the accounts. The accounts then would be managed by them, but the customer success manager would have a dashboard of number of, so you, you bought 50 users. So out of your 50 users, how many of them have logged in on a daily basis? What's your login rate? Your login rate is only 80%. Okay, well, you've got you know, 20% of you guys who you're paying for are not logging in. So why are they not logging in? They were comped on making sure the logging rates were high. So because once you have high logging rates, you need more licenses, you buy more. So these guys would look at metrics every day saying, why are these you know, 20% not logging in, calling them, hey, can I help you? Do you need a dashboard? Can I build a dashboard for you? So in SaaS, it's all about consumption. So the role of account management has dramatically changed. You're spot on there. So Puneet, to your later point about uh, knowing the customer's business, so would you say that now the person, the salesperson needs to be a lot more domain expert, more industry specific, or are we, are we just, can you comment on that a bit more? You know, I don't think they have to be more domain specific. Uh, are you talking about the sales guy or the customer success guy? Uh, I'm actually thinking the salesperson. I know the customer success probably has to yeah. be a lot more, but for the salesperson to speak the language, as you said, you know, I've been observing your business, these are the two, three things, you know, this is what you need. So, I would, it depends on the size of deal. If you're going into, and in the, in the industry, if it's a very large size deal, you know, those multi-million dollar deals still exist. You definitely need somebody who's more verticalized. But if it is a smaller size transactional deal, you can't have verticalized teams that do thirty, forty thousand dollar deals. So what I have seen is generalists. Let, let's also not forget, right? What what uh, you know? What uh, let's just say in the old world, what an Oracle CRM could do or Siebel could do, is now broken out into six different vendors doing that same thing. So the the, the footprint of a SaaS product is much smaller but much deeper than what you know, old class enterprise software applications used to be. And this is just purely in the technology world. So as a result, a generalist today can still go pretty deep, but not as wide, which they don't need to go anymore. So I would say in the mid-sized deals, I would say generalists work really, really well. When you're talking about very large size, you know, Fortune 100, Fortune 200 size customers, there you definitely have people who are more vertically focused. That's what I've seen at least. All that means Prep, yeah. Before getting in front of the client. Yeah. Each time he goes with increasingly deeper insights, industry insights, all this information is available. You just have to spend time in understanding the situation as an industry. Yeah. The video you have been referring to that was sent to our yeah. CEO yeah. for our education, can you post it in the forum? I c Sorry? It's not yet closed. I don't think I can. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll see if it's possible. I'll talk to our legal team. I don't think I can, but yeah, it was, it was genius. 25-year-old guy. It was genius. So just, just a follow-up question, Puneet. Yeah. Um, so with the SaaS model, uh, building customer-specific or segment-specific applications have become easier. Right. In the olden days, you used to have sort of a horizontal yep, yep. product, and you had professional services team, et cetera, and they would customize it, et cetera. Yep. Now, I'm going back to Sanjay's comment. Because in the SaaS model, you can actually customize vertical and go deep, yep. um, that also means that the language is not the same across True. customers. So 
you may see a fragmentation of sales uh, because of that, right? Because people now expect the SaaS product to be tailored to the hospital or tailored to the old age home like this. But then, but then if you have a s application that's specific for a hospital, then that's what they'll be selling to hospitals. And then you have, you know, somebody who is in that, yes, be focused on hospitals, but, you know, that's the only industry they know about. If you have something like a, like a sales force, which is not hospital specific, you need a generalist there. But you have something that's in a specific industry, then yes, you'd obviously need, you need somebody yeah, for that the market. Thing is, uh, if you're building something horizontal, you may be better off taking it and verticalizing it uh, because that's become the expectation of the customer now. Yeah. With, uh, True, possible. Can I ask you one direct question? Yeah. You are a VP of big companies in IT. You have all the expertise, all the tricks of the trade. Now I request you, can you sell to a pharma company? How can I, you, me personally? I, I couldn't. Why? I couldn't. Uh, I'll be honest with you. It's a good question, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have the domain experience. Yeah. Yes. So if somebody says, I am VP of da 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 da, and I have all the management experience of 15 years, I can tell this to you, but he doesn't have a domain experience experience and do I give him a job or not? Well, so I mean, it, I, I like to say, you know, when, when, when sales guys become sales managers, they become stupid. So I've been stupid for many, many years because we forget it's very difficult. You know, it's a lot of fun to go and sell, to close a deal, the thrill of closing the deal and nothing that beats that in my opinion. But once you start going to management and you start managing bigger and bigger teams, you lose that depth. You're more focused on process. You're more focused on, you know, moving a sales cycle through, seeing trends in a business. So you really lose touch of, and, and that's one of the things I hate, is I'm losing touch of, you know, the individual deal. So if somebody were to come to me and say, go sell a pharma deal, I would, I mean, I could maybe have done it, you know, 15 years ago. Today, I would be, I would be a mess in front of the customer. So I, I, would, I would, you know, if somebody has managed, I, I tell my guys that if you've managed for more than two years, that's a point where you make a decision if you want to go back as a sales guy, because frankly, a good sales guy will make a lot more than a sales manager will, money-wise. So many people who have good sales guys go into management and say, what is this? I'm making less money. I said, you've got two years where you might have a chance to go back. If you've crossed two years, you're not as strong in the art of sale, of the actual sale, than you were when you were a sales guy. But I know a ton of people. Sure. So I have this connection, so I can make it happen to you. But you need a job. So how do I assess? Well, I think you just said it right there. That person needs a job. So that'd be my perspective. Yeah. <laughs> so this is account management process. Um, You know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at some of these slides and talks about, you know, how do you break into, how do you break into an account? And then how do you continue to penetrate that account? Uh, and how do you, you know, frankly, uh, close that account? You know, a long customer strategy or relationship starts performing beyond expectations in the first opportunity that is one. Failure to see expectations are not based on jeopardizing future risks. I mean, what, what this slide is saying, guys, is, as you go into, into an account, you've got to really know aspects of that account. You've got to know how they buy. This is critical. I mean, sales guys will go and say, this is what I think would, would, would differentiate an average sales guy from a good sales guy. That's a, we, we call it happy years. A, a customer comes and says, oh yes, we have budget. And we need to, we need to, we need to, uh, you know, we need this implemented um, by next quarter. Sales guys, like, I got myself a deal. I'm very, very happy. We call that happy years. The reality is that person has no idea what the buying process is. This is the toughest part in selling, is getting through the procurement people or getting somebody to write you a check or getting you know, a PO created. You know, have, you, have you defined what the business problems are? Do you have the trust and relationship of executives across the organization? So an effective account management process takes into account everything, not just, you know, a simple yes, we, we, in fact, if somebody says they have budget, then you've got to go deeper. 
where's the budget coming from? Who's got the budget uh, approval? Who's the signatory? Have you met the signatory? I mean, frankly, we ask, depending on the size of deal, how many kids does that signatory have? How well do you know the guy? Is he vegetarian or non-vegetarian? Seriously, ask those questions. I want to know if you know the person who you're saying is going to sign the damn deal. Do you know this person? How many times have you met this guy? Have you taken him out for lunch? You know, have you guys played golf or not? Um, you got to know a lot. I mean, and this is just here. This is just here. When you're talking about the buying process, you know, where's the budget coming from? Is it a centralized budget or does every business unit have the budget? Is there one, one person who approves the budget or the many people who approve the budget? So to manage an account in an initial sales process, you know, you've got to be able to dive deep. And that, that was frankly differentiates uh, a good sales guy from a bad sales guy. Uh, people will have happy years and say, I, I asked the question, do you have budget? The answer is yes, so we're good to go. Versus really going deep and saying, where is that budget coming from and who has authority over it? That's why sales guys are worth it from, from, a, from a dollar's perspective. The good guys know how to do that. A sales plan. You know, this has changed a lot. This has definitely changed a lot. You look at, you look at what, what's, what's needed in, in creating a sales plan. You know, Raj talked about, you know, two weeks before meeting and, and looking at a deal and trying to strategize on that deal. And that's true. You need to do that. You know, understanding the vision, understanding the mission of the company, the goals of the objectives, the goals of the executives, objectives they have to hit, you know, the strategy of a company, how do you align to that strategy, what are the tactics could mean, the features, benefits, et cetera, that, 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 that you try and uh, will use to compete against the, the competition. Sales plans can be very, very powerful, and they can be a complete waste of time. I have seen... Great sales reps who have no sales plans and be extremely successful. I have seen great sales reps with very detailed sales plans and be extremely successful. So I've seen both aspects of it. The key really is understanding your customer. If you look at a SaaS model today, where you have you know, an, aver an average guy who's got, you know, in the mid-market, which is where SaaS is very prevalent today, is roughly doing, at one time managing between 10 and 15 account or 10 and 15 active sales strategy, sales accounts at one time. There's no way they're going to put such a large sales strategy or account plan in front of a customer. And frankly, this will change next month. These things change very, very, they're very fluid. So in doing this, you have to try and see what is it that, what type of account are you going after? If it's a large value deal, and it's a large size account, it's an, you know, a company that maybe has, is very politically inclined, then you need something at this level. And this, this can take somebody you know, two, three, four weeks to put together. But if you're selling you know, more transactional-based uh, deals, I, I have seen this actually be a waste of time. Just know, know your customer. Have you created the value? Have you differentiated yourself? Do you have an ROI that justifies the, the account, the, the sale? Have you had a personal relationship? Do you have you know, four or five check marks? And move forward. And if Do you present all this to the point of, OK, let's say we are in a deal now. We are talking to a liaison, but he is not the decision maker, but he is going to connect us to the decision maker. So even to the liaison who may or may not be a subject matter expert, do we need to present all these things? Mm -hmm. This is for the company. Yeah. This is what this is what you're doing inside the company to understand the approach you're going to take, who they are, what's important to them, what are their objectives, what is their strategy, how does your then strategy align to them, what are the tactics that that, that they're using, how do your tactics align to those, and how you're going to execute. I mean, all of this is this is an internal document more than anything. Also, like a big pharma company, you have to understand their missing links also. Sure. So at that point, I have to spend like you know, I'm spending only three days now. But how deep should I go to the point of contact? You have to like, let's say Genentech. I have to have the product profile of all the Genentech and what are his missing links there, which I do have. So how detailed I could go to the point of contact and say. So let me ask you a question. The product that you're talking about, what, what dollar size deal do you think it's going to be? That is the biggest problem. I'm not going to be placed. 
<laughs> okay, let, let, me, let me try and answer that in a different way then. If you're going to go charge them $1,000 a month, which today is a very viable deal in the SaaS world, would you go and spend multiple days trying to, trying to go and, you know, if you're selling them a $1,000 a month deal, my gut says it should be a very large market where you can have many of these customers ready. Then I would say going and spending three, four, five days creating this might not be worth it. But if you're selling them a, you know, a million dollar transaction, which is again, another very viable approach today, then I would say you better do your homework before you go into an account of that size. It really depends on what you're selling and what dollar amount you're trying to sell. Now, $1,000 definitely, more towards a little higher end. So we need to do really good presentations. Sure. Are not coming through. When do you know that? Uh, do you need to fire the sales guy, or do you need to give him more runway? So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I'll tell you. The, the, I'll tell you the way I do it, at least. De if deals are not coming in, it's one of it's easily one of two reasons. It's it's deals are not coming in because the sales rep is not any good, or because you haven't empowered the sales rep to be successful. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, same thing. The, pro the sales rep is not empowered to be successful because the product is not meeting the needs. So I think that's a decision you have to make and see which one is it. Uh, if the sales rep is not able to differentiate, add value, you know, talk about the product uh, you know, in, in a meaningful manner, get rid of the guy. There are many out there. But if you haven't empowered them to be successful, let it be the product's not there or you know, uh, you, the tools are not there for them to be successful or there's no and the compensation plan is not attractive for them, then maybe that's what you need to fix. But I mean, every company has a different time from when a sales rep comes on board and is successful, and is when they say starting to deliver on their monthly or annual numbers. You know, very comp I would say it's anywhere between, I have seen, you know, the low end anywhere between zero to one month when they're on and they've started, they're fully ramped. These are very, very transactional, very quick deals, all the way to complex transactions usually is about you know, nine months or so before they are, you know, actually delivering numbers. So it's somewhere in there, but that's really a question, you know, that you have to look at and see if you have given them the tools or not. Hi, question. In your experience, what have you seen? Is it, do you make close the deal more when you appeal a lot to the psychology of the buyer? I mean, I know psychology plays a big part. Or is it all these jazzy 20, 30, you know, page presentations? So does statistics or data make a lot of difference or it's more like... You know, he talks to you for 15 minutes, he has this trust, and he says, okay, let me go ahead and try your product. Sure. There are many kinds of sales guides. I, for example, am one I've never played. I hate golf. I have never gone and played golf once with a customer or prospect. It's just not me. You know, a lot of people, want, I mean, if you want to play golf with me, you've got, I, could, I bet you have other things you want to do in your, for six hours versus go and play golf with me. Or, you know, or, to me, it's about creating value. So there are many sales reps who close deals based on relationships. And that's what they have. I know some guys who frankly didn't know what the product did, but you just trust them. You just know that what they're saying is spot on. So you are inclined to them. And then there are other people that the, the, the school that I come from, which is if you create value, people will come to you. So that really depends on the sales rep. I would like to say that today it's more about creating value. Uh, and people want to see that. They want, no, nobody really cares if you have a 70 deck presentation. In fact, Today, we go and say there's no need to have presentations anymore. You know, if anything, maybe it's one or two slides, but we try and go away from presentations. So I would say people are not as enamored with that. They're enamored with, show me what your product does for me. How does it make my job better? How does it make the company better? And how does it personally affect me? So as I said earlier, we have gone in and said, I want to talk to you about these three people who used us and you know, this is what has happened to their sales career, or this is what happened to their careers. Happy to make a connection with you and them so that they can see, wow, this really worked and look what it did for that person, maybe it'll help me as well. So I think it's all about value. A lot of people built on relationships. Um, I personally don't, I tell my sales team not to use slides at all. In fact, we don't use any slides. I have a question. Uh, in, in the SaaS world, how, what is the propensity of your customers to switch fast compared to what you have seen from your earlier days? Sure. Because in the earlier days, like Oracle and Cisco, they would get into an account and they would never leave. 
Yeah. I think those days are numbered, isn't it, uh, correct? They are numbered. I mean, you know, I will say if Salesforce is an account and you try and replace Salesforce, it's not easy. It's not easy. How sticky is it? Because now there are more APIs, more integration, more automation. Sure. It, it's definitely easier. It's definitely easier if a customer wants to leave. It's, you know, it's, it's not the way it was 10 years ago. It is almost impossible. But I will say, if you, if you, if you are a, a, a very broad technology within a company, let's use Salesforce, for example, where your entire sales team, your customer success team, your services team, and maybe your marketing is using your, that, that product. I mean, I can't tell you how many customers I know that will say they hate Salesforce because of how much they're paying Salesforce. But they can't do anything about it. Because Salesforce is, and then and if anything, you want to talk about APIs, because of those APIs, you're connecting five, six other applications that are all being run through Salesforce. You do commissions is running through, you know, exactly coming into Salesforce. You're doing your uh, configure to order going through Aptus coming into Salesforce. You're doing Marketo, the results are coming into Salesforce. So guess what? Salesforce is not going anywhere. I would say if you have a broad technology, it's tough to get rid of you. If you're very thin, it's not that difficult. And I've seen both. Before you do, can you give your contact? Sure. You know, I'm sorry, guys. I forgot to, I forgot to bring that. Um, so first name is Puneet, P-U-N-E-E-T. Last name is Aurora, A-R-O-R-A. -R -R -A. And my email is um, last name, so Aurora underscore Puneet at Hotmail.com. I'm still one of the guys who pays my $35 a year to Hotmail. Um, yeah, if you, if you hit a certain level of storage, they do charge. And uh, my, uh, um, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very, very, uh, very active on LinkedIn. Would love to connect and, and answer any questions if I can. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.